Imagine a history not written in stone, but etched in the sands of time, constantly shifting and revealing new truths. At the heart of Western civilization and the Abrahamic faiths lies Judaism, a beacon of spiritual and cultural influence. But what if this ancient religion, believed to be as old as time itself, was actually younger than we have ever imagined? This riveting documentary, backed by cutting-edge scholarship, dares to ask the provocative question. Did the practice of Judaism as a way of life by the Judeans truly begin around the second century BCE, rather than in the deeper recesses of history? Such a revelation could shatter our understanding of the Bible's antiquity and the roots of a faith that has shaped the world. Prepare to delve into a narrative unlike any you've heard before. We're not just retracing steps in the sands of history. We're digging new paths to uncover startling truths. Subscribe, hit the bell, and like this video. Grab a spade and join us on this unprecedented journey into the heart of Judaism's origins. This documentary promises to reveal insights so profound. They will redefine how we view one of the world's oldest religions. Let's dig in. Judaism is an ancient religion, but what if we could show you actual evidence that it isn't as old as the Bible portrays it? Would this pique your interest? We will dig up the truth using archaeology and see how well this matches the claims of the biblical text. For 2,000 years, the religion of the Jewish people we call Judaism, which is a way of life completely centered around the laws of the Torah, has been overwhelmingly documented. This way of life encompasses everything from birth to death for the Jewish people. The Torah are the laws handed down by God to Moses, written in the first five books of the Bible. Of course, Myth Vision doesn't think Moses actually wrote these books, let alone likely existed. So we might ask, if Moses didn't get these laws from God on Mount Sinai in actual history, then who wrote them? And when did these laws actually become practiced by actual worshipers of Yahweh? In this documentary, we want to show you the evidence from archaeology of when Judaism actually began as a religion, assuming we didn't have the biblical text trying to tell us these answers. You may be asking, why not just go with the biblical account to answer this question? Simply put, the Bible isn't giving us a literal history of past events as they actually occurred. For example, it's clear that no exodus happened as recorded in the Bible based on scientific archaeological research. We can discuss what the Bible is doing, but one thing it isn't doing is actual accurate history as we know it in the 21st century. The scholar this amazing research will be based off of is Dr. Yonatan Adler, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Land of Israel Studies and Archaeology at Ariel University in Israel. He has served as a member of the State of Israel's Council for Archaeology since his 2018 appointment by the Minister of Culture. His book, which sent shockwaves through the Biblical Studies scholarly community, is The Origins of Judaism, an Archaeological History historical reappraisal. The goal of his work isn't to answer the complex biblical traditions origins question, but to reveal the hard archaeological facts of when Judaism actually began as a religion of the people. Dr. Adler wants to reevaluate the 19th century hypotheses that the emergence of Judaism happened in the post-exilic period as early as Persia, meaning these Protestant academics were postulating that after the Babylonian exile, 
we find the emergence of post-exilic Judaism, with the religion of pre-exilic Israel being something rather different. These academics would focus on what biblical authors had to say in order to deduce their reasoning, instead of looking at the behaviors and social history of the general populations of Judea based off archaeology. If the general populations of Jews practiced Judaism, this would imply they had the laws. But if there is no archaeological evidence suggesting that they did practice any of these laws in these periods, well, this could be clear evidence that no such laws were practiced or possibly even known by the general folks. To be upfront, Dr. Adler will express how these Jews in Persia appear to not be practicing the Torah as their religion until the Hasmonean period. But this is a crucial point I need to drill down as it lays heavy on my heart for Jews who suffer from ongoing anti-Semitism. The Jews or Judeans have existed in Levant way, way back, with a continuous tradition of Yahweh or Yahu, or however you want to pronounce the deity of the time, worship, and even El in Ugarit. The peoples have had a deep history in these regions, yet what is new or dramatic about this documentary is their religion or practice of Torah. Anyone who knows biblical scholarship and its variations of scholarly educated guesses should be cautious on being too certain about many of the ideas like dating or who actually wrote these texts, etc. The academics vary from maximalist to minimalist, dating things in two extremes and some fall in the middle. What is not as easy to dispute are the hard archaeological facts of when the lifestyle articulated in the Torah was practiced by Jewish peoples. Dr. Adler starts with a time in history where we absolutely know with certainty that Judaism existed and was practiced by adherents of this way of life following the Torah. The Torah's teachings guide various aspects of Jewish life, including daily prayers and rituals, weekly Sabbaths, annual festivals, dietary restrictions, significant events through one's life, marriage and family matters, legal issues, both criminal and civil, agricultural practices, and rules for maintaining ritual purity. Additionally, in ancient times, these teachings also included specific rites related to temple worship. Dr. Adler starts in a period when Torah practice was clearly happening using archaeology and works backwards in history to a period where the practice of Torah are no longer evident in the archaeology. This reasoning leads him and me to think the origins of this practice happened when we see evidence of it in the archaeological record. I can picture many scholars who have much built so much of their speculations off of a biblical portrayal being upset at the finds of this groundbreaking evidence. However, the reason Dr. Adler avoided getting into the questions of when the Torah was written, or the biblical text for that matter, is the endless, flimsy speculations which are weak compared to actual archaeological evidence. We can guess all day long when it was written, and where, and all of these things. The interpretations of Jewish law by rabbis, particularly those compiled in the Babylonian Talmud, have significantly shaped Jewish life. However, rabbinic law, or halakha, wasn't universally adopted by all Jews. Before and even after the emergence of rabbinical authority, various Jewish groups like the Pharisees, Sadducees and Essenes practiced their own interpretations of the Torah's laws. Post-70 CE, after the fall of Jerusalem, many Jewish communities followed the Torah's teachings differently from rabbinic interpretations. A notable example is the Karaites in the early Middle Ages. But there are many instances throughout Jewish history of non-rabbinic adherence to the Torah. Definitions We will follow the definitions used by Dr. Adler in his wonderful work around terms like Judaism, Torah, also Jews, and Judeans, so you can understand the meaning going forward in this documentary. I ask that everybody watching this gets a copy of this book because it goes way deeper than this documentary making the case as solid as possible. So get you a copy. Judaism. In this research, the term Judaism is chosen to describe a specific way of life. This choice aligns with both modern English usage and its etymological origins in ancient Greek. Judaism, as defined in Webster's Third New International Dictionary, encompasses 
Jewish rites, ceremonies, and practices, as well as the broader cultural, social, and religious beliefs and practices of Jews. This definition reflects what most English speakers understand by the term today. Regardless of the contemporary Jewish denomination, practices of Judaism are deeply rooted in the Torah, serving as either a source of inspiration or formal authority. For example, a Jew participating in Passover traditions is practicing Judaism, irrespective of their specific religious affiliation. The English word Judaism originates from the ancient Greek term Judaismos, which is derived from the verb Judaizo, meaning to act like the Judeans. In historical contexts, Judaismos signifies behavior in accordance with the laws of the Torah. This study employs Judaism to refer to the Jewish way of life governed by the Torah, focusing on societal practices rather than individual observance. The emphasis here is on observable practices practices rather than beliefs. This approach is chosen because practices are more visible or visibly discernible in a large group, whereas beliefs are more abstract and subjective. Studying a large population's beliefs can often lead to vague generalizations, so the focus is on the patterns of behavior that can be more concretely observed and described from an external perspective like archaeology. Torah. It's important to know that Torah can mean different things depending on the time and text. Here's a simple guide to what I mean when I use Torah, Dr. Adler says. Firstly, Torah in the Hebrew Bible, which is a sacred text for Jews, is a term used a lot over 200 times. It comes from a Hebrew word that means to teach or to instruct. So in this sense, Torah means a kind of teaching or instruction, and it's often linked to laws and regulations. In ancient Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible, Torah is translated to mean law. This version of Torah is closely connected to Moses, who according to these texts, received instructions from God that included various laws. Secondly, toward the end of a period in Jewish history known as the Second Temple Period, Torah started being used to specifically refer to the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. This is the version of Torah often mentioned in stories about public readings in synagogues. The third meaning of Torah, which is more common in Jewish religious writings called rabbinic literature, is much broader. Here, Torah refers to the whole system of laws and interpretations based on the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. These laws are pretty complex, sometimes seem to contradict each other, so they've been interpreted and discussed a lot over time. This Torah includes all the debates and different views that various Jewish groups have had about these laws. In Dr. Adler, book, when he says Torah, he's talking about this broad, complex system of laws and interpretations that grew from the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. When he's only talking about those first five books, he uses the term Pentateuch. And when he's referring to the original Hebrew or Greek terms in ancient texts, he translates them as instruction or law. Jews and Judeans. The study of ancient text reveals a group known by various names such as Yehudim in Hebrew and Yehudai in Aramaic. These names Names dating back to the first millennium BCE evolved over time. In Greek and Latin, the group was known as Judei or Judaioi, and in Latin, Judei, I'm probably not pronouncing the Latin correctly, but you get the idea, respectively. This name further evolved in European languages, leading to the English term Jews. In recent scholarly debates, there's an interesting discussion about the most appropriate term to use when referring to this group in ancient times. Some scholars suggest the term Jews implies a religious identity similar to Christian or Muslim and argue it should only be used when the group had developed a distinct religious identity. They propose using Judeans for earlier periods. This debate centers on determining the historical point at which the group transitioned from being Judeans to Jews. In this study, however, we are not taking a stance in this debate. Our focus is on the emergence of Judaism among this group. We need a neutral term that doesn't predefine conclusions, and Judeans seems most suitable for discussing the period from the middle of the first millennium BCE to the first century CE. This term helps us discuss early epochs, like the Iron Age, where the term Jews is generally avoided by scholars. We will not delve in the origins of the Judeans or Israel as a people in this study. While their formation into a distinct group is intriguing, our research begins when they are already recognized as a distinct group. We will explore when and how the Judeans began to adopt the Torah as the central guide of their collective way of life. History of Scholarship
Dr. Adler covers the history of the scholarship on early Judaism in his book, so it's important that we cover it as well for those interested in understanding where the field has been and is currently at. He points out that most of the scholarship is centered around the biblical texts for drawing conclusions rather than the archaeology from the social history unearthed by people's actions, which can be evaluated in a concrete way. Some scholars believe that after returning from the Babylonian exile, the Pentateuch was widely acknowledged and followed as the Torah. But this theory hasn't been extensively examined. In the 19th century, several key scholars significantly influenced the understanding of early Judaism and the Hebrew Bible. Wilhelm Martin Leberich De Wet. Now I'm probably butchering the name, but he was around in 1780 to 1849, known as the founder of modern biblical criticism. De Wet's 1804 dissertation argued that Deuteronomy was written later than the other Pentateuch books. He identified Deuteronomy as the book of instruction or book of the covenant mentioned in the days of Josiah. In later works, he posited a fundamental shift in Judean religion and culture after the Babylonian exile, distinguishing pre-exilic Hebraism from post-exilic Judaism. His work, however, was based more on his interpretation of biblical texts than on evidence of actual practices among the Judeans. Karl Heinrich Graf, 1815 to 1869, and Abraham Kennan, 1828 to 1891. Expanding on DeWitt's ideas, Graf and Kennan proposed that part of the Pentateuch dated to the post-exilic period, as they align more with post-exilic works. Kennan introduced the term priestly code for these late sources, suggesting Ezra and Nehemiah played key roles in establishing them as part of the Pentateuch, founding Judaism. Neither of these scholars looked into evidence outside of the Hebrew Bible's literature to see the actual practices of the Judeans. Julius Wellhausen, 1844-1918 Building upon previous works, Wellhausen formulated the documentary hypothesis, dating different sources of the Hebrew Bible to various periods. His 1883 prolegomena to the history of Israel had a profound impact, arguing that the Mosaic Law's promulgation marked the transition from ancient Israel to Judaism. Edward Meyer, 1855 to 1930. Meyer's 1896 work suggested that Judaism originated with the Persian Empire's enforcement of the Torah as law for Judeans. He differed from Velhaus by emphasizing the role of Persian imperial mandate rather than an internal Judean initiative. These scholars largely focused on literary history of the Hebrew Bible, often accepting biblical narratives at face value without seeking additional evidence for the Torah's influence on the daily lives of ordinary Judeans in the Persian era. In the 20th century, biblical scholarship built on 19th century foundations, exploring new areas such as the literary history of the Hebrew Bible, especially the Pentateuch. Key discoveries in Mesopotamia and Judean desert enriched comparative studies and textual criticism. Scholars also began questioning the graf Valhausen documentary hypothesis, considering alternative theories like the supplementary hypothesis and the fragmentary hypothesis. However, much of this scholarship continued to focus on the intellectual circles that authored the biblical texts, without deeply investigating how the legal parts of the Pentateuch gained authority outside these circles. The widely accepted division between pre-exilic Hebraism, meaning before 586 BCE, and post-exilic Judaism, after 538 BCE remained largely unchallenged. In the 1990s, scholars revisited Meyer's hypotheses that the Persian Empire authorized the Pentateuch as the official law for Judeans. This theory of Persian imperial authorization sparked debates but lost favor by the early 21st century. Discussions centered on the Achaemenid policy towards local legal norms and whether the Pentateuch was specifically endorsed by the Persians. However, there was limited investigation into whether the Persian population of Yehud knew about the Pentateuch or practiced its laws. The details of this debate will be explored later in this documentary.
during the 19th and 20th centuries, there was a significant increase in epigraphic discoveries that provided insights into the rituals and cultic practices of ancient Judeans. These discoveries included writings on various materials like papyrus, skin, pottery shards, ostraca, stone, metal, clay tablets, seals, seal impressions, and coins. Generally, these epigraphic remains from the Persian and Hellenistic eras were integrated under the assumption that the Torah was already an authoritative law for ordinary Judeans. However, any findings that contradicted this assumption were often dismissed or reinterpreted to align with the Torah. A notable example is the collection of the 5th century BCE Judean writings found at Elephantine in southern Egypt. This Judean community appeared to be unaware of or in contradiction to the Pentateuchal laws. Some scholars, starting with Valhausen, considered this community an isolated remnant of ancient Israel, out of touch with mainstream Judaism. Others, like Basil of Porton, interpreted the text to portray the Elephantine Judeans as knowledgeable and observant of Torah laws. Nonetheless, there was no thorough investigation into whether the broader Judean population during the Persian period was aware of and regarded the Torah as authoritative. Archaeological findings related to Judeans in the Persian and Hellenistic periods have been limited and inconsistent, leading to a lack of archaeological studies on Judean observance of the Torah during these times. Ephraim Stern's studies suggested that the absence of figurines in Judea and Samaria during the Persian era indicates a religious revolution consolidating Jewish monotheism, however conclusive evidence remains sparse. In 1992, a book, Judaism, Practice and Belief, E. P. Sanders, or Ed P. Sanders, introduced the concept of common Judaism, referring to a set of practices and beliefs shared by most Judeans in the first century CE. This concept was groundbreaking for its focus on the everyday lives and beliefs of ordinary people. Sanders used a combination of critical analysis of first century text and archaeological evidence to explore the behaviors and beliefs of average Judeans. He concluded that during this time, Judeans globally shared a common set of practices and beliefs centered around the Mosaic Torah and other sacred scriptures. Sanders' work was pioneering in its rigorous examination of Torah observance among the masses in antiquity and was notable for incorporating both textual and archaeological data. While not all of Sanders' arguments gained unanimous scholarly acceptance, his idea of a shared set of practices and beliefs among ordinary Judeans has been highly influential. It's worth noting that Sanders focused specifically on the first century CE and did not delve into the historical development or origins of this common Judaism. Shea Cohen's 1999 book, the Beginning of Jewishness explores the origins of a distinct identity he terms Jewishness, emerging from an earlier Judean identity. Cohen argues that initially terms used for Judeans like in Hebrew and Aramaic language, Yehudim and Yehudai were purely ethnic, linked to the geographic homeland of these people. These early Judeans had their own language, customs, institutions, dress, cuisine, and religion, but no single characteristic was predominant in defining their group identity. Cohen identifies a significant shift during the late 2nd century BCE, influenced by Hellenistic culture and politics. The Hasmonean era, according to Cohen, marked a key turning point where the Judean state under Hasmonean rule transformed into a league allowing the inclusion of non-Judeans. This period marked the first instance where non-Judeans could adopt Judean religious identity without assuming their ethnic geographic identity, marking the beginning of Jewishness, as Cohen defines it. Cohen's work is notable for placing the emergence of a distinct religious identity of Judeans in the Hasmonean period rather than the Babylonian exile. His focus is on the categories of identity and the potential for transitioning between them, posing questions about what defines us versus them, and whether they can become us. Interestingly, Cohen does not delve into the origins of Torah observance among ordinary Judeans. He assumes that by the end of the 2nd century BCE, the Torah was widely known and observed, focusing instead on when Torah observance became a central characteristic of Judean identity.
John Collins' 2017 book, The Invention of Judaism, places the Torah at the forefront of its analysis, tracing the evolution of the concept of Torah in Judean literature from Deuteronomy to the era of Paul. Collins highlights a significant transition in the mid-2nd century BCE, which he terms a halakhic turn. This period saw a surge in literature deeply concerned with halakha, Jewish law, evident in works like the Temple Scroll, Jubilees, and particularly 4QMMT. Before this shift, Collins notes, there was no similar focus on legal obligations in various Judean literary traditions, including wisdom literature, tales of the Eastern diaspora, early Enochic literature, and others. He observes that until the mid-2nd century BCE, the Mosaic Torah was revered and respected, yet it wasn't necessarily seen as something requiring detailed observance. Collins' work is significant in understanding the dramatic change in the treatment of the Torah in Judean literary works after the Hasmonean Revolt. However, it's important to note that this study is centered on intellectual history, not social history. It examines the evolution of the idea of the Torah among generations of Judean intellectuals and does not delve into whether ordinary Judeans were aware of these intellectual developments or even if the concept of the Mosaic Torah was widely known among the general Judean populace. Reinhard Kratz, Historical and Biblical Israel, originally published in German in 2013 and later in English in 2015, distinguishes between the history of Israel and Judah and the biblical tradition. Kratz argues that while these two elements are intertwined, they are not identical. He bases the history of Israel and Judah on epigraphic and archaeological evidence supplemented by critical analyses of the biblical tradition. Kratz revises Wellhausen's idea about the Babylonian exile being a dividing line between ancient Israel and Judaism. He suggests that ancient Israel coexisted with Judaism both before and after 586 BCE. To add clarity, Kratz introduces the term biblical Judaism, commitment to the biblical tradition and Mosaic Torah, and non-biblical Judaism, Yahweh devotees without such commitment. His study of various Jewish epigraphic records led him to conclude that the Hasmonean revolt marked the real historical divide between these two forms of Judaism, with non-biblical Judaism likely predominating before this period. Kratz's work is significant for acknowledging the possibility that the biblical tradition, including the Mosaic Torah, may have been marginal in Judean society for centuries. His study is among the first to actively consider evidence, especially epigraphic, from the Persian and Hellenistic periods concerning ordinary Judeans. He investigates whether these people were aware of the biblical tradition and if they considered it authoritative. Kratz, like Cohen and Collins, views the Hasmonean period as a formative era. For Cohen, it marks the emergence of Jewishness as an identity. For Collins, it signifies a halakhic turn. Among Judean intellectuals and for Kratz, it represents the widespread dissemination of biblical tradition among Judeans. Critical Evaluation of the Evidence Dr. Adler builds on the work of Sanders and Kratz, focusing on when ordinary Judeans first learned about, accepted, and practiced the Torah rules. Our approach combines textual and archaeological evidence. We'll start by analyzing a range of Torah practices and prohibitions, each in a separate chapter or section. The first century CE, a time when these laws were widely known and followed by Judeans, serves as a starting point for us. From there, we'll trace back to find the earliest evidence of these laws being known and practiced, determining the earliest possible emergence of Judaism. The concept of terminus antiquem is crucial here. It's a technical term used in archaeology to denote the latest possible date when something could have started. For example, if we find evidence of Torah practices dating back to the 2nd century BCE, it means Judaism must have emerged by then or earlier. Our aim isn't to prove that every Judean strictly followed the Torah, but to identify patterns showing widespread knowledge and adherence to its laws in society. Our analyses indicates that compelling evidence of the masses 
knowing and practicing Torah laws dates back to no earlier than the mid-2nd century BCE. This sets the overarching terminus antiquem for the initial emergence of Judaism. Chapter 7 of Dr. Adler's book focuses on reassessing the origins of Judaism before the earliest date of Torah observance established in the earlier sections. Since there's no evidence of widespread Torah observance or knowledge among Judeans during this period, our approach here differs from the data-driven analyses in previous chapters. In this section, we examine indirect and contextual evidence from the Persian and Hellenistic periods. This includes looking at broader textual evidence that previous scholars have considered indicative of early Judaism, we'll also investigate whether specific Torah rules or categories of laws were not observed at certain times. Although such evidence might be limited and anecdotal, a significant amount of it could suggest the Torah wasn't yet widely recognized as authoritative. Additionally, we'll assess the political and cultural contexts of Judeans during these times. This involves exploring historical reasons and mechanisms that might have influenced the emergence of Judaism at a particular time. Our findings suggest that the Persian period might not be the best era to look for the origins of widespread Torah observance. Instead, the period between Alexander the Great's conquests around 332 BCE and the establishment of the Hasmonean state in the mid-2nd century BCE appears more promising for understanding the origins of Judaism. We will examine the text and methodologies used to investigate the origins of early observance of Torah laws among Judeans. Textual sources, first century text, works by Philo of Alexandria, Josephus, Flavius Josephus, they're key. Josephus' writings, which often reference earlier periods will be critically assessed for their historical accuracy. We're going to look at the New Testament. These texts, generally dated from the mid-first to early second century BCE, are considered for their insights. We're going to look at Greek and Latin authors. Their works offer valuable external perspectives on Judean society around the first century. We're going to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. These are important for both their archaeological and compositional dates primarily from the 2nd or 1st century BCE. We're going to look at Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha. These challenging to date texts are generally treated as belonging to the 2nd or 1st century BCE. And of course, the Hebrew Bible. These texts, mostly composed before the 2nd century BCE, provide evidence for earlier periods and will be analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis for more precise dating. Challenges in using these texts. These texts were written by intellectuals, not representative of the general Judean population, which was likely largely illiterate. The authors might have been influential elites or fringe figures with little societal impact. The texts were not intended as empirical accounts of the masses' behaviors, but were often ideologically driven. Any reference to the behaviors of ordinary Judeans in these texts requires careful interpretation to separate historical facts from the author's idealizations or agendas. Methodological approach. Critical reading of of these texts is essential, where they advocate for or against certain practices. It's important to discern whether this reflects actual societal norms or the author's ideals. The goal is to extract historically useful information about the real behaviors and beliefs of ordinary Judeans, distinguishing between historical reality and literary idealization. Archaeological evidence, a window to real human behavior. Archaeology offers a unique glimpse into the past, showing us not just ideals, but real human actions. Unlike texts that might convey what people thought or aspired to, the physical remains unearthed by archaeologists reveal what people actually did. These artifacts, from tools to pottery, were mostly made for everyday use, not to spread complex ideas. They give us a direct look at the lives of ordinary people, not just the thoughts of a few. While interpreting these artifacts requires skill, they are invaluable in understanding the widespread behaviors of past societies, offering a clearer and more tangible picture of history than texts alone. This documentary is organized into sections just like Dr. Jonathan Adler's book, each focusing on specific practices or prohibitions in ancient Judaism. 
Dietary Laws examines prohibited meats as outlined in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, 3 through 21. Ritual Purity Laws investigate laws from Leviticus 11 through 15 and Numbers 19. Prohibition of Depicting Forms looks at the ban on depicting human and animal forms and artwork as stated in Exodus 20, 4 through 5, Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 18, and Deuteronomy 5, 7 through 9. Tephilim and Mezuzah Rituals studies these practices based on Exodus 13, 13, 19, 16, Deuteronomy 6, 8 through 9, and Deuteronomy 11, 18 and 20. First century Jewish practices explore circumcision, Sabbath prohibitions, Passover sacrifice, Day of Atonement fasting, Sukkot festival rituals, and the seven-branched menorah. Emergence of the synagogue analyzes the development of synagogues and their role in spreading Torah knowledge. Each chapter follows a similar format. The first section establishes the practice or prohibition in the first century, where we know it's happening. Second section seeks evidence of these practices before the first century. And then their subsections focus on textual literary sources and archaeological epigraphic evidence. Finally, we will examine evidence from periods before the established earliest emergence of these Jewish elements. It assesses the likelihood of Judaism's emergence during the Persian period and its potential development in the early late Hellenistic periods. Let's begin with what people ate and what this tells us. Dietary Laws Dr. Adler goes straight to the heart of the matter with what the Judeans ate. What the Jews ate separates them from the surrounding peoples. We will explain briefly what they are permitted and restricted from eating and showing from the several sources, working from the first century backwards in time, finally assessing the archaeological evidence to show when they didn't keep the diets prescribed in the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, which should give us reason to doubt the people of Judea even knew about these laws, or at the very least, these laws were not known outside of a small scribal circle. The Pentateuch, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, contains a variety of dietary laws that have shaped Jewish culinary practices. These laws, primarily found in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, categorize certain animals, fish, birds, and insects as either permissible or forbidden for consumption. For instance, land animals are generally prohibited unless they have both divided hoofs and chew cud, excluding species like camels, hares, hyrexes, and pigs. Sea creatures are only permissible if they possess both fins and scales. Specific birds are forbidden, with list of these species provided in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Additionally, most creeping things, such as rodents, reptiles, and insects, are banned, except for certain flying insects like locusts and crickets. The regulations also dictate the circumstances under which animals can be eaten. Animals that die naturally or are killed by other animals are not to be consumed. The requirement seems to be that animals must be intentionally slaughtered by humans, although this is not explicitly stated. Consuming blood and certain fats is also prohibited, as is eating an ox that has killed a person. Newly planted fruit trees have a restriction where their fruits cannot be eaten for the first three years. Beyond these general prohibitions, there are also time-based dietary rules. During the seven-day festival of unleavened bread, all leaven and leavened bread are forbidden. There are also restrictions on new grain crops until a specific offering is made. Certain classes of people, like priests or those under a Nazarite vow, have additional prohibitions such as abstaining from wine and other intoxicating beverages. Food consecrated for religious purposes also has specific regulations. For example, the Passover sacrifice must not be eaten raw or boiled, and sacrificial meat from peace offerings cannot be consumed after the third day. Consecrated food is also subject to restrictions based on the eater's purity status and their relation to the priesthood. An additional custom mentioned in Genesis relates to the avoidance of eating the sinew of the hip, a practice reportedly stemming from the patriarch Jacob's injury in that area. This study aims to explore how these dietary laws were observed by Judeans in the first century CE. Evidence suggests that these rules were widely followed as confirmed by both Judean and non-Judean writers of the time and supported by archaeological findings. The investigation will also delve into earlier periods to trace the origins and adherence to these dietary practices. In the first century CE, his 
historical texts provide evidence that Judeans followed strict dietary laws as outlined in the Torah. This is supported by both written records and archaeological findings. One notable source is Philo of Alexandria, born in 25 BCE, a writer of that era. He delves into the Torah's dietary laws, emphasizing the moral and disciplinary lessons they impart. While it's not entirely clear how strictly these laws were followed in daily life, Philo's narrative indicates a widespread avoidance of pork among Judeans, a practice that was even recognized and questioned by the Roman Emperor Gaius Caligula during a Judean delegation's visit in Rome in 40 CE. Philo's recounting of events in Alexandria, Egypt in 38 CE further illustrates the extent of this avoidance. He describes a harrowing incident where Judean women were forcibly fed pork during anti-Judean riots. Some women complied out of fear, but others refused and faced torture. These accounts wouldn't have resonated with Philo's audience if pork consumption wasn't commonly avoided by Judeans of the time. While these stories don't confirm adherence to all Torah dietary laws, they strongly suggest that the community was notably committed to the prohibition against pork. Overall, these examples from Philo's writings, after a glimpse into the dietary customs of Judeans in the first century CE, highlighting their dedication to certain Torah laws, especially the avoidance of pork. In the New Testament, food-related discussions often extend beyond strict adherence to the Pentateuchal dietary laws. These texts frequently address broader ethical and social concerns about food, such as eating meat offered to idols, sharing meals with non-Judeans or those considered sinners, and the implications of eating certain foods in states of ritual impurity. For instance, in the Book of Romans, the Apostle Paul's writing suggests a divergence in dietary practices within the early Christian community. He notes that some people believe in eating all foods, while others restrict themselves to vegetables, which may imply varying attitudes toward following the Torah's dietary laws. Paul emphasizes a spiritual perspective, suggesting that no food is inherently profane, but becomes so if someone believes it to be. He advises against letting food choices disrupt the community's unity. The Book of Acts provides a more direct reference to dietary laws. It recounts a vision experienced by Peter, where he sees a variety of animals and is instructed to eat them. Peter initially refuses, citing their status as unclean according to Jewish law. However, the vision's message, repeated thrice, is what God has cleansed should not be considered profane. This vision is interpreted as an allegory for the inclusion of Gentiles into the early Christian community, equating them with the animals in the vision and arguing that they should not be seen as unclean. Additionally, a letter from the early Christian leaders in Jerusalem to Gentile believers advises them to abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from strangled animals, and from fornication. This directive likely stems from the belief that the meat of strangled animals contains blood which is prohibited. This guidance, while not encompassing all Jewish dietary laws, indicates an effort to bridge the dietary practices of Jewish and Gentile Christians, rooted in the broader principles outlined in Genesis regarding the sanctity of life and blood. Overall, the New Testament's approach to dietary laws reflects a shift from strict adherence to Jewish law towards a more inclusive and spiritually orientated understanding of food practices, while still acknowledging the importance of these laws in the Judean community. Flavius Josephus, a first century historian, frequently commented on the dietary practices of Judeans, highlighting their strict adherence to religious food laws. He detailed several specific prohibitions, including the consumption of animals that died naturally, certain fats from goats, sheep, and oxen, a specific sinew, pork, and other unspecified animal species. Josephus emphasized the importance of properly cleansing meat to remove blood before it could be considered fit for consumption, reflecting a key aspect of these dietary laws. Josephus noted the exceptional dedication of Judeans, particularly the Essene sect, to these dietary restrictions even under the threat of torture or death. This commitment was so integral to their identity that those accused of violating these laws often faced severe social backlash within their communities. Some Judeans, when accused of eating forbidden foods, would flee to the Samaritans for refuge, underlying the severity of such accusations. Interestingly, Josephus also observed the influence of Judean dietary 
practices beyond their community. He claimed that many non-Judeans across the Roman world had begun to adopt some of these dietary restrictions. This adoption was part of a broader trend where various aspects of Judean religious practices, including observing the Sabbath and other rituals, gained popularity among different populations. Josephus' writings provides a comprehensive look at the dietary customs of Judeans in the first century, highlighting their strict observance and broader influence of these practices and how they had that practice and its influence in the Roman world. Writings from various Greek and Latin authors between the first and early second century CE provide additional perspectives on dietary practices of Judeans, particularly their avoidance of certain foods like pork. This abstention was often noted and discussed by these authors, indicating its prominence as a cultural identifier. For instance, the Greek geographer Strabo commented on what he perceived as the Judeans' superstitious avoidance of meat. Appian Makothos, a Hellenized Egyptian writer, specifically criticized Judeans for not eating pork. Similarly, Aristianus, writing in the late 1st century CE, advised medical practitioners to consider the ethnic background of their patients, suggesting abstention from prescribing pork to Judean patients. Plutarch, a Greek biographer and essayist, delved into the reasons behind the Judean abstention from pork, debating whether it was due to reverence for the animal or aversion. He also noted their avoidance of hair meat. Tacitus, a Roman historian, offered a different perspective, hypothesizing that Judeans avoided pork due to a historical association of pigs with a skin disease that reminded them of a past plague. The satirist Juvenal humorously remarked on the longevity of pigs in Judea due to their abstention from pork, implying that his audience was well aware of this Judean dietary practice. Sextus Empiricus, a philosopher, echoed the sentiment of Philo and Josephus regarding the links to which Judeans would go to avoid eating forbidden foods, including during torture or death rather than consume pork. Epictetus, another philosopher, observed that the consumption of pork was a contentious issue among various cultural groups, including Judeans, Syrians, Egyptians, and Romans. Finally, Pliny the Elder, a Roman author, mentioned the Judean dietary restrictions regarding fish, although his understanding of the specifics appears to have been somewhat inaccurate. These diverse observations from non-Judean authors illustrate the widespread awareness and discussion of Judean dietary customs in the broader Greco-Roman world. They highlight how Judean abstention from certain foods, especially pork, was a notable and discussed aspect of their cultural and religious identity. Archaeological Insights into Ancient Diets, really the first century. In the field of archaeology, various traces left behind by ancient civilizations provide us with insights into their way of life. Among these, remnants of ancient mills, particularly food remains, are especially revealing. Unlike the often subjective accounts of ancient texts, these remains offer a more objective view of the diets and eating habits of past societies. Archaeology mainly provides insights into certain dietary laws mentioned in the Pentateuch, such as those relating to animal consumption, the bone Bones of animals, for instance, are key archaeological finds that shed light on ancient diets. However, interpreting these remains can be challenging. For example, while certain markings on bones can suggest deliberate butchering, their absence doesn't necessarily indicate natural death or predation. Our focus will be on two specific groups prohibited in the Pentateuch, pigs and scaleless fish. These are chosen because their remains are frequently found in archaeological sites across the Levant. Conversely, remains of other animals mentioned in the Pentateuch, like dogs, horses, or camels, are less common and harder to link directly to human consumption. The data analyzed here comes exclusively from Southern Levantine sites, particularly those identified as Judean. A common mis- conception in scholarly literature is interpreting the absence of certain foods in archaeological records as evidence of ancient dietary taboos. Just because a population didn't consume a particular food doesn't mean they considered it wrong or inappropriate. Numerous factors could influence dietary choices, and absence alone isn't sufficient to imply a societal prohibition. It's crucial to explore various plausible explanations before concluding that a dietary choice was to taboo driven. While it's hard to prove that a food was deliberately avoided for normative reasons, it's easier to show the opposite. If we find significant evidence of a particular food in ancient diets, it's safe to assume that this food 
wasn't widely shunned. In other words, finding remains of pigs or scaleless fish in Judean sites would suggest that at least some inhabitants didn't avoid these foods. With this framework, we now examine the presence or absence of pigs and scaleless fish in the zoo archaeological record for first century Judeans, aiming to draw reasonable conclusions about their dietary practices. For the past 30 years, scholars have extensively studied pig consumption in the southern Levant, particularly during the Iron Age. However, there is less comprehensive research on this topic for the Persian, Hellenistic, and Roman periods. Yet some some site reports from these eras do provide relevant data. In this discussion, Dr. Adler draws upon a research study done in 2005 by Leora Kolska Horwitz and Jacqueline Studer Ramboknitz, forgive me if I butchered your names, unpublished 2011 doctoral thesis and recent archaeological reports from the last decade. I want you to look at this table with me. The table represented here, which is found in Dr. Adler's book, shows the frequency of pig remains in selected early Roman, mostly first century CE, Judean archaeological sites. The data includes the number of identified specimens, NISP, of pig bones, the total NISP of all animal bones, and the percentage of pig bones relative to the total. The number of identified specimens shortened is called NISP. So when you look at the chart, you'll see NISP, number of identified specimen, which is a count of how many bones of a given species were found. Look at this at the top, you can see, which is really table one, you'll see Qumran, Jerusalem, Eastern City Dump, Jerusalem, City of David. Notice pig bones, NISP, zero, 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 zero. And then you get to Eastern City Dump, three, Jerusalem, parking lot, one. You can keep going. You see some of the numbers are higher than others, but in the second site, which are Roman era non-Judean sites, there's a frequency that is much higher in some of these areas. And this pretty much I asked Dr. Adler, how do we simplify this? And he said, pretty much in Judean sites, you get no pigs. In non-Judean sites, you get pigs. And of course, if there is one or two bones that they do find, you could argue really simply that maybe some of these Judean sites had Gentile or non-Judeans in these locations. It's also possible possible that not every Judean followed the law at this period. The frequency of pig bones at Judean sites are notably low compared to non-Judean sites from around the same period. Non-Judean sites, less affected by destruction during the first century Judean revolt, provide more stable data for this era. Table 2, of course, as we said, represents pig bone frequencies from Roman era non-Judean sites. The stark contrast between the two sets of data strongly suggests that pig consumption was rare or non-existent at first century CE Judean sites, but common at non-Judean sites at the same time. This aligns with the hypotheses that Judeans avoided pork due to the Torah's proscription against pig consumption. However, other explanations might also exist for this phenomenon. The absence of pig remains in Judean sites is consistent with the Torah's dietary rules, but we should also consider alternative hypotheses. This is particularly important for earlier periods where textual evidence is scarce. Interestingly, pig bones do appear occasionally, albeit in small numbers, at Judean sites. These could represent remains left by non-Judean visitors, ethnic minorities, scavengers, or even deviations from dietary laws by some Judeans. While the Torah's dietary rules were widely observed, absolute adherence was not universal. In the southern Levant, archaeological sites have revealed remains of scaleless fish, primarily categorized into two groups. Cartilaginous fish, including sharks and rays, and catfish. The term catfish encompasses several families, but in the Levant, Claridae is native, found in coastal rivers and the Sea of Galilee, among other places. Bagridae and Maclidae are non-native, brought from the Nile. Both cartilaginous, both cartilaginous fish and catfish lack scales and therefore could have been avoided according to dietary laws in the Pentateuch. Studying whether first century CE Judeans consumed these fish is difficult due to limited available data from this period. The evidence we have is not comprehensive enough to make definitive conclusions, but it offers some insights. In Jerusalem, two fish assemblages from the early Roman period were found. One assemblage contained four catfish bones, 1.4% of total fish bones, and the other included three catfish bones and one shark bone, 3.5% of total. Notably, all catfish bones were identified as non-local, originating from the Nile at Masada, 327 fish bones. 
were found, all from fish with both fins and scales, suggesting adherence to dietary laws. In Caesarea, an early Roman period cesspit near Herod's Hippodrome contained three catfish bones out of 107 fish bones, 2.8%. Given Caesarea's mixed population of Judeans and Greek-speaking non-Judeans, it's unclear who consumed these fish. The current data set is too limited to draw firm conclusions about the fish-eating habits of first-century Judeans. The low frequency of scaleless fish remains suggests these were not not commonly eaten. However, the presence of some scaleless fish remains, especially in Jerusalem, hints at possible occasional deviations from the Torah's dietary prohibitions. More comprehensive studies are needed for a clearer understanding of these ancient dietary practices. But both textual and archaeological evidence from the first century CE largely corroborate the understanding that Judeans adhered closely to their dietary laws, notably avoiding pork and possibly other prohibited species like scaleless fish. The archaeological record, while aligning with historical texts, also leaves room for further research and discovery, especially regarding the consumption of fish. This comprehensive approach provides a nuanced understanding of the dietary habits and cultural practices of first century Judeans. Earlier Textual Evidence Evidence suggests that Judean dietary restrictions were known in the Roman world by the 1st century BCE. For example, a tale recounted by the 5th century Latin author Macrobius features a quip by Augustus about Herod the Great humorously hinting at Herod's adherence to Judean dietary laws by preferring to be Herod's pig rather than his son, a reference to a, the avoidance of pork. Earlier, a letter from 43 BCE noted by historian Josephus exempts Judeans from military service, acknowledging their inability to bear arms on the Sabbath and their specific dietary needs. A similar decree from Sardis, also mentioned by Josephus, directs market officials to ensure appropriate food for Judeans. These documents, if authentic, indicate a broader awareness of Judean dietary customs. Diodorus Siculus, writing around the same period, references the unique laws of Judeans, possibly alluding to their dietary rules. He also describes an event where Antiochus the fourth desecrated Judean sacred texts and compelled Judeans to consume pork, a direct violation of their laws. Additionally, a remark by the Roman orator Cicero around 70 BCE, preserved in Plutarch's later writings, humorously touches on the Judean aversion to pork. The Dead Sea Scrolls, some dating back to the Hasmonean period, contain references to Pentateuchal dietary prohibitions. These include straightforward bans on consuming blood, as seen in the Genesis Apocryphon, and the Temple Scroll. The Damascus document offers more detailed discussions on the consumption of blood and fish, and permitted insect species like locust. It concludes that fish blood is prohibited, while the treatment of locusts differ due to their unique biological makeup. The Temple Scroll also forbids carrion, and another manuscript, 4Q Halakha A, references the prohibition of consuming torn animals. There's also a discussion on the consumption of a fetus removed from a properly killed pregnant animal, with the fetus being seen as not directly killed by humans, thus either categorized as carrion or torn. Interestingly, while texts in the scrolls engage in detailed interpretations of dietary laws, including criteria for permitted insects and a mention of a prohibited bird species, they don't explicitly mention a ban on pork. This absence doesn't necessarily indicate non-observance among contemporary Judeans, but highlights the scrolls' role in reflecting a culture deeply invested in discussing and possibly debating these dietary laws. In the realms of the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha, texts potentially dating to the last two centuries BCE, references to Judean dietary laws frequently emerge. Jubilees, for instance, emphasizes the prohibition against consuming blood, threatening severe consequences for violators. Notably, it specifies the blood of beasts, birds, and cattle are off limits, perhaps implying an acceptance of fish blood, contrary to other interpretations. The test of Asher delves into the complex definitions of clean and unclean animals, citing pigs and hares as paradoxically half-clean, yet essentially unclean, reflecting the Pentateuchal verses. In doing so, it also allegorically ties these dietary laws to moral virtues and vices, indicating that such rules were familiar to its audience. The letter of Aristius contains a detailed explanation from the high priest Eleazar to an Egyptian delegation about the 
rationale behind considering certain animals unclean, such as non-cloven hooved animals or those not chewing cud, including birds of prey. The narrative of the Maccabean period, particularly in the books 1, 2, and 4 Maccabees, highlights the significance of these dietary laws through stories of Judeans who chose martyrdom over violating these restrictions, specifically eating pork. While the historicity of these accounts is uncertain, they reflect the importance of dietary laws to their authors and audiences, what we call verisimilitude. Turning to the Hebrew Bible outside the Pentateuch, evidence for dietary restrictions is sparse, mainly appearing in cultic or ritual contexts rather than everyday diet. For instance, Saul's troops are criticized for consuming meat without properly draining the blood, seen as a cultic misstep rather than a dietary one. Similarly, Isaiah's condemnation of consuming pig's flesh is framed with the context of idolatrous practices, not as a general dietary rule. In Ezekiel, dietary regulations are addressed specifically to priests, with no indication of broader applicability. Even Daniel's choice to avoid royal food in Nebuchadnezzar's court seems more a personal or cultic decision than adherence to any known dietary law. The Pentateuch itself doesn't imply that its food regulations were formalizing already existing taboos. The only long-standing food taboo mentioned is the avoidance of the hip sinew, as narrated in Jacob's story, which is possibly an etiological legend created to explain an ancient practice. Beyond this, there's no textual evidence to suggest widespread observation of dietary restrictions among Judeans or Israelites before the 2nd century BCE. Archaeology on pigs. In the Hasmonean and Herodian periods, few Judean sites have reported pig remains. At Herodium, about 7.6% of the animal bones found in a construction area were from pigs, but the workers' ethnicities are unknown. At Qumran, spanning from the Hasmonean into the early common era, no pig bones were found in four different contexts. Similarly, no pig remains were identified at Nebi Samuel. In Jerusalem, during the Hasmonean era, pig bones constituted a minimal portion of the faunal remains, 0.6% in one area and 0.2% in two others. Going further back to the early Hellenistic period, pig remains were equally scarce. During the period from 586 to 332 BCE, pig remains were rare or absent in Judean sites. For example, at Ramat Rahel, only 2% of the bones were from pigs, and in another area of Jerusalem, the percentage was a mere 0.1% Iron and Bronze Age context. Moving into the Iron and Bronze Ages, the presence of pig remains becomes more varied. During the Iron Age 2C, pig remains were nearly absent across the region, including Judah, Philistia, and Edom. In the Iron Age 2B, pig remains were more common in the northern kingdom of Israel, but rare in the southern kingdom of Judah and other areas. This pattern continues in the Iron Age 2a, with pig bones mostly absent from southern Levant sites except in Philistine urban centers. In the Iron Age 1, pig remains were virtually absent in the southern Levant except in Philistine areas. During the Late Bronze Age 2b through 3, pig remains were either absent or found in negligible amounts at most sites, with no notable exceptions in areas under Egyptian influence. Interpreting the data, the absence of pig remains across various periods and regions suggests that multiple cultural, ecological, and socioeconomic factors influenced animal husbandry and consumption practices. Hesse and Wapnish proposed several pig principles, such as environmental conditions, settlement patterns, and economic factors affecting the choice to raise pigs. However, new research has shown that these factors can have unpredictable effects. In summary, while pork consumption was limited among early Iron Age Highlanders and later Judeans, it was also uncommon among other groups in the region. This suggests that the avoidance of pork was likely due to a combination of ecological, economic, and possibly cultural factors, rather than a specific cultural taboo. Fish. The study of ancient fish remains provides valuable insights into the dietary habits and cultural practices of historic populations. This analysis Analyses focuses on fishbone assemblages discovered in various archaeological sites in Judea, primarily around Jerusalem, dating from the Iron Age II to the Hellenistic period. In the last decades of the first century BCE, two significant fish assemblages were discovered. At Masada, 
1,494 microscopic fish bones were found in fish sauce remnants, with no scaleless fish remains identified. Similarly, a collection of 38 fish bones from the northern slope of Herodium from the same period also lacked scaleless fish. Three smaller fish assemblages from Jerusalem's Givati parking lot dating to the Hellenistic period provide a rare glimpse into the fish consumption practices of that era in Judea. These assemblages vary in the frequency of catfish bones, indicating differing consumption patterns across periods. More extensive assemblages from earlier periods, specifically the Persian period, were found in the same location and nearby Area G in the city of David. These collections show a higher percentage of catfish bones, including one assemblage with remains possibly from a shark or ray. A notable pattern emerges from the Iron Age II, circa 950 to 586 BCE, assemblages where scaleless fish especially catfish, are prevalent. These finds come from various locations in Jerusalem, including the Afel, the eastern slope of the city of David, and the Givati parking lot. An important assemblage from Ramat Rael also highlights this trend, with a significant number of catfish bones discovered. These findings reveal that scaleless fish, particularly catfish, were commonly consumed in Judea during the first half of the first millennium BCE. Pattern appears to continue into the Persian period, although data from the Hellenistic period are too limited for definitive conclusions. These dietary patterns challenge the notion that the dietary restrictions in the Pentateuch, particularly the prohibition of scaleless fish, were based on long-standing consumption habits. Instead, it suggests that such prohibitions were established independently, indicating a deliberate choice by the Pentateuchal authors rather than adherence to existing cultural norms. This could imply that other dietary laws in the Pentateuch might also have been formulated without being rooted in pre-existing dietary traditions. This section explored the earliest evidence of Judeans following dietary rules like those in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Research into texts and archaeological finds showed that by the first century CE, Judeans were well known for strictly following specific dietary laws. These included avoiding pork, as shown by the scarcity of pig remains in Judean sites from this period, unlike in non-Judean areas. Evidence also suggests that Judeans avoided scaleless fish, though this data is less conclusive. However, before the 2nd century BCE, there's no clear evidence of such dietary practices. The only hint of an early food taboo is a story in Genesis about avoiding the hip sinew. While pork wasn't a major part of Judean diets from the Iron Age onwards, this doesn't necessarily mean it was due to a religious or cultural taboo. Furthermore, the widespread presence of scaleless fish bones from this era suggests that the dietary rules against such fish from the Pentateuch weren't yet followed. In summary, it appears the strict dietary restrictions among Judeans as detailed in the Pentateuch only began to be observed from the Hasmonean period onward. Purity Laws you might be like me thinking, how can one know if people practiced purity restrictions or rules in archaeology? I soon found out that this was easily answered by archaeologists like Dr. Adler. This section will reveal textual and archaeological evidence to show you where these practices clearly happened in history with people actually practicing these purity laws and when the evidence doesn't support them practicing it. The concept of binaries like clean, dirty, or pure, contaminated is common across human societies, both ancient and modern. This might be rooted in disease avoidance, as even early societies without scientific knowledge understood the dangers of contamination. These physical binaries often extend into moral judgments, such as good, bad, or right, wrong. This is not surprising since physical contamination can lead to diseases, and similarly, moral contaminants might be seen as causing social problems. Many cultures also use these binaries to describe more complex and abstract concepts which we can term ritual purity. This concept goes beyond simple physical or moral cleanliness. In ancient Judean society by the first century CE, there was a detailed set of rules about ritual purity based on the Pentateuch. These rules outlined causes of impurity, how it spreads, and how to restore purity. Impurities could come from various sources like certain animal carcasses, childbirth, skin diseases, or contact with the dead. 
Different actions like touching or carrying these sources could transfer impurity. To remove impurity, procedures like wading, bathing, or in some cases, specific rituals were prescribed. The rules were extensive, covering clothing, utensils, houses, and food. Each had specific guidelines for purification, including washing, burning, or destroying contaminated items. By the first century CE, these rules were not only interpreted by scholars, but also actively followed in daily life. This section will explore the origins and evolution of these practices, tracing back to the earliest evidence of their observation in Judean society. Textual Evidence Philo of Alexandria observes, which he's a Jewish philosopher, refers to various purity laws in his writings. For instance, he mentions that after marital relations, both partners must bathe before touching anything. He also talks about specific impurities like gonorrhea and scale diseases, explaining that affected priests must wait for these conditions to clear before resuming their duties. Furthermore, he describes how touching a corpse or experiencing nocturnal emissions requires purification rituals, including bathing and waiting until evening. New Testament accounts. The Gospels and Acts in the New Testament provide a more vivid depiction of Judeans actively practicing these purity laws. They highlight rituals like hand washing before meals, immersing after visiting the market, and purifying dining utensils and furniture. These accounts indicate that these practices were common and expanded upon the original Pentateuchal regulations. Josephus's reports. Josephus, a first century Jewish historian, frequently cites the purity laws in his work. He notes that people with certain impurities like scale diseases or during menstruation were restricted from entering parts of Jerusalem or the temple. He also describes how these laws impacted daily life, such as avoiding cities built over grave sites due to the risk of impurity. Archaeological evidence, first century purity AD. Stepped pools. Across Judea, Galilee, and Perea, over a thousand stepped pools have been found, mostly dating from the early Roman period, mid-1st century BCE to 132 to 135 CE. These pools, lined with waterproof plaster and often connected to rainwater channels, feature steps leading down to the pool floor. For decades, scholars have identified these as ritual baths used for purification, a viewpoint supported by the physical features of these pools. The design of the pools, with steps leading directly into and out of the water, suggests they were primarily used Used for immersion. The distribution of these pools aligns almost exclusively with areas known to have been inhabited by Judeans. Their absence in non-Judean settlements further supports their cultural specificity. This pattern, coupled with the construction and features of the pools, confidently identifies them as Judean ritual immersion pools. I want you to look at the immersion pool that we saw at Magdala, the synagogue. Historical texts like those in the New Testament and writings by Josephus corroborate the use of water immersion for ritual purification among Judeans. This aligns with the widespread construction of these pools, suggesting that ritual immersion was a common and regular practice, not limited to specific groups or religious occasions. The pools were used not only for temple visits, but as part of everyday life in maintaining ritual purity. The locations of these pools vary indicating different uses. Most are found in residential areas, suggesting daily domestic use. Others are near public spaces like synagogues, temples, and agricultural sites, implying broader communal and occupational purposes. This variety reflects the significance of purity, ritual, in various aspects of Judean life during the first century CE. The archaeological evidence of stepped pools in Judea from the first century CE strongly suggests that ritual immersion for purity was a widespread and integral part of daily life, reflecting a deep cultural and religious practice. Chalk vessels. Chalk vessels, commonly found in Judean archaeological sites from the first century CE, offer intriguing insights into the cultural and religious practices of the time. These vessels, made from soft chalk, include various forms such as mugs, pitchers, bowls, and large jars. Scholars generally agree that Judeans produced these chalk vessels due to a belief in their resistance to ritual impurity. Interestingly, chalk was not a popular material for making tableware or 
were storage containers in other periods or regions of the southern Levant. The widespread use of chalk during this specific era raises questions about why Judeans chose a material otherwise deemed impractical for such purposes. In the Roman, early Roman period, materials like clay, metals, glass, and wood were commonly used for tableware and storage, but Judeans uniquely opted for chalk. This choice seems to be connected to their strict adherence to the purity laws found in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. These laws detail how different materials react to impurity. For instance, pottery needs to be broken if impure, while other materials can be purified. Stone vessels, however, are not mentioned in these laws, leading to the belief that they do not become impure. This understanding likely influenced the Judeans to create vessels from chalk, a form of stone. Despite its porosity and dust, Dustiness. They might have applied treatments or sealants to overcome these drawbacks. The use of chalk vessels was apparently widespread among Judeans, indicating a broad adherence to ritual purity laws in their daily lives. The chalk vessels distribution pattern, confined mainly to Judean settlements, supports this interpretation. Excavations in the Lower Galilee have unearthed large-scale production sites, suggesting a significant demand for these vessels among Judeans. This phenomenon of using chalk Chalk vessel sheds light on the Judeans' religious practices and their interpretation of purity laws, showing a commonly deeply engaged in maintaining ritual purity in everyday life. Based on textual and archaeological evidence, it's clear that the Judeans were practicing these purity laws during the first century AD. Now let's turn to earlier periods and see what we find. Before the first century AD, textual evidence of purity. Textual evidence from various sources provides insights into the practice and evolution of ritual purity laws among Judeans particularly the Hasmonean 140-37 BCE and the Herodian 37 BCE to 73 CE periods. Josephus, a 1st century Jewish historian, relates two stories from the late 1st century BCE that emphasize the importance of ritual purity. One story involves a high priest who becomes ritually impure due to a dream, demonstrating the observance of purity laws and temple practices. Another story hints at concerns over Gentile soldiers impacting the purity of Judeans during temple festivals. Josephus also mentions a decree by Seleucus I Nicator, which accommodated Judean customs regarding the use of oil, potentially indicating early adherence to purity laws. The Dead Sea Scrolls, dated from the 2nd or 1st century BCE, contain detailed expansions on the Pentateuchal laws of purity ritual. These texts show how Judean communities like those at Qumran interpreted and developed these laws, such as regulating or having regulations on bathing for purification and specific rules regarding corpse and skin disease impurities. The Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha, ancient Jewish writings, occasionally reference ritual purity laws. These texts provide further evidence of the observance of purity laws, with narratives demonstrating adherence to dietary restrictions and purification practices. Josephus also cites a proclamation by Antiochus III Megas, suggesting that Pentateuch-like purity laws were observed among Judeans as early as the 2nd century BC. However, the authenticity of the document is debated. When examining the Hebrew Bible, texts thought to predate the 2nd century BCE show limited evidence of a system or ritual purity similar to that of the Pentateuch. While moral and ritual purity is a reoccurring theme, detailed regulations akin to the Pentateuchal laws are largely absent. Suggested these practices may not have been widely known or observed among Judeans before the 2nd century BCE. These various texts collectively indicate that while some form of ritual purity laws was known and practiced among Judeans, the detailed system found in the Pentateuch likely became more prevalent and developed in later periods, especially during the Hasmonean and Herodian times. Archaeology before the 1st century AD on purity. Immersion pools. 1st century BC evidence. Archaeological findings show numerous immersion pools from the 1st century BC, especially in palaces of Herod the Great. These pools, often found near living quarters or bathhouses, suggest a widespread practice of ritual purity. Earlier evidence, pools dating back to the Hasmonean period, mid-1st century BCE, have been discovered, indicating an even earlier practice of ritual purity. However, the exact start date of these practices remains unclear. Chalk vessels, late 1st century BCE, findings of chalk vessels from this period, primarily in Jerusalem and Jericho, indicate the use of specific materials for ritual 
ritual purity. Earlier periods, no clear evidence links earlier stone vessels to ritual impurity practices. Epigraphic evidence, elephantine inscriptions, a text from the 5th century BCE refers to concepts of purity, but its connection to Pentateuchal laws is not definitive. This lack of clarity extends to other inscriptions as well. Conclusions 1st century CE, there is substantial evidence of adherence to ritual purity laws among Judeans. Before 2nd century BCE, earlier evidence does not clearly demonstrate the practice of Pentateuchal ritual purity laws. This indicates that the widespread observance of these laws likely began after or around the 2nd century BCE. While there's strong evidence of ritual purity practices in the 1st centuries BCE and CE, tracing these practices back to their origins remains challenging due to limited and ambiguous archaeological and epigraphic evidence. The evidence does suggest the common folks were not practicing these rituals on a massive scale, if at all, before the Hasmonean period. Figural Art the Decalogue, or Ten Commandments, found in the Bible's books of Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, begins with a directive that uniquely acknowledges Yahweh as God, forbidding the worship of other gods. This is evident in the commandment, I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Early Jewish scholars like Philo and Josephus viewed this as the first commandment. The subsequent verses, often seen as separate commandment, forbid creating graven images or idols, regardless of whether they represent other deities or not. This prohibition covers any any form that exists in the heavens, on the earth, or in the waters. The text emphasizes Yahweh's exclusive devotion and the consequences of idolatry, extending to multiple generations, but also highlights the enduring love for those who follow these commandments. In Deuteronomy 4, the prohibition against creating images is more expansive. It includes any living creature, given that no physical form was seen when Yahweh spoke to the Israelites. This comprehensive ban includes a representation of male or female figures, animals, birds, and aquatic life. The rationale is that any depiction of a living creature might be misconstrued as a representation of Yahweh, who is formless. This section aims to explore how first century Judeans interpreted these commandments, particularly the broad prohibition against depicting living creatures in art. This includes both sacred and secular contexts. Despite some depictions existing, there was a general trend among Judeans to avoid figural art of living creatures. This section will investigate the earliest evidence of this practice and seek to understand the historical context and reasons behind this phenomenon. The focus is not the origins of aniconism, the avoidance of images and religious practices, or the development of monotheistic worship in Judean culture. Instead, the emphasis is on how and when the legal prohibition against figural art became a widely observed practice. This exploration is crucial for understanding the cultural and religious dynamics of the period. Evidence from the first century writer in examining the writings of Philo and Josephus, two prominent figures in the first century, we find compelling insights into the prohibition of certain artistic expressions among Judeans. This prohibition, which goes beyond mere religious worship, is intriguingly distinct from the worship of multiple deities and offers a glimpse into the broader cultural and philosophical attitudes of the time. Here's Philo's perspective. Philo delved into the Decalogue, emphasizing that while those who transgressed the first commandment by worshiping multiple gods were indeed in error, their offense paled in comparisons to artisans who violated the second commandment. These artisans, according to Philo, were guilty of crafting images that, from various materials such as timber, stones, silver, and gold, and disseminating them throughout the world. In Philo's view, these artistic endeavors were far more detrimental as they clouded the eye of the soul and obscured the true understanding of the ever-living God. For Philo, the act of creating such artistic illusions was akin to leading souls astray through deception and false impressions, a sentiment that echoed Plato's earlier views on deceptive art forms. What stands out in Philo's perspective is his allusion to an actual contemporary context in which Judeans refrained from certain forms of painting and sculpture, even when these had no direct connection to religious worship. Let's look at Josephus's insights. 
Josephus shared Philo's perspective, distinguishing between the act of crafting certain images and the worship of foreign deities, although at times these two elements converged. Josephus recounted instances where Judeans vehemently opposed the introduction of Roman imperial cult images into Jerusalem, illustrating the collision of artistic representation with a religious practice. However, Josephus also elucidated that Judean law prohibited the depiction of living creatures, even when these representations had no association with foreign gods. He made it clear that this prohibition extended not only to idolatry, but also to profane artistic depictions, such as Greek family portraits. Josephus argued that these practices were unprofitable to both God and humanity, thereby emphasizing the distinct nature of this prohibition. Josephus provided further evidence of this prohibition by describing the adornments of the desert tabernacle enclosure on the Holy of Holies, emphasizing the absence of representations of living creatures. Notably, he omitted mention of the embroidered cherubim, a design mentioned in the Pentateuchal prescriptions. When Josephus did discuss the golden cherubim set upon the Ark cover, he portrayed them in an apologetic manner, highlighting their uniqueness. Additionally, Josephus condemned King Solomon for creating animal images for the molten sea and his throne, interpreting these actions as impious in light of the prohibition against graven images. Interestingly, the biblical narratives about Solomon did not express wrongdoing, emphasizing that Josephus's perspective was influenced by the authoritative Torah of his time. In another example, Josephus narrated his involvement in demolishing a palace in Tiberias constructed by Herod Antipas, which featured representations of animals in its architectural elements. Josephus explained that such architectural styles were forbidden by the laws, reinforcing the idea that the prohibition extended beyond religious idols to encompass any graven images. Here's a perspective beyond Judea. The avoidance of statuary among Judeans was notably enough that it drew the attention of non-Judean writers in the first century. Strabo, the Greek geographer, that Moses had instructed against all forms of image carving. Similarly, the Roman historian Tacitus noted that Judeans revered a single formless god and refrained from crafting representations of gods in human form. This prohibition extended to statues not only in religious contexts, but also in cities and temples. Even their mortal kings and the emperors did not receive the honor of statues. Tacitus' account highlights that the Judean aversion to graven images extended beyond religious worship and had broader cultural implications. The first century writings of Philo and Josephus, as well as accounts of non-Judean sources, provide valuable insights into the prohibition of certain artistic expressions among Judeans. This prohibition went beyond religious worship and encompassed the creation of graven images, reflecting the cultural and philosophical attitudes of the time archaeological discoveries of the first century. Fortunately, a significant body of archaeological artifacts from the first century CE adorned with various forms of artwork and linked to Judean culture had endured to the present day. In this section, we'll explore this evidence to assess the prevalence of figural art avoidance as described by the first century authors. The wealth of evidence under examination encompasses artistic designs found on coins designed for Judean use, decorative elements in architecture, funerary art, as well as artwork on pottery and various small archaeological artifacts. It's important to note this investigation will primarily focus on finds from the Southern Levant, as the number of decorated artifacts from the first century CE that can be conclusively associated with Judeans outside this region is quite limited. Looking at coins, throughout the first century CE, Judean coins minted for local use were typically adorned with images of inanimate objects or floral motifs, with a notable absence of figural representations of humans or animals. This practice sharply contrasted with coinage in most other parts of the Roman world, where numismatic imagery commonly featured portraits of the reigning emperor on the obverse side of, or depictions of the emperor's family members. The reverse side of these coins often displayed additional human or, more rarely, animal figures, often drawn from Roman mythology. In the neighboring independent king of Nabatea, coins featured portraits of the king and queen, occasionally including images of eagles. However, coins minted by Archelaus and Antipas, who succeeded Herod as rulers in different regions, maintained the traditional of non-figural motifs. Archelaus's coins showcased items like cornucopias, naval symbols, and grape clusters, while Antipas's coins exclusively featured floral designs such as palm trees and wreaths. 
Notably, none of these coin types included figural images. In contrast, coins minted by Philip, another of Herod's sons and successors, consistently featured portraits including those of Augustus, Empress Livia, or Tiberius, and sometimes Philip himself. This stark difference in numismatic practices among Herod's heirs was not coincidental. Archelaus and Antipas ruled over regions with predominantly Judean populations, while Philip governed territories in the northeastern part of Herod's realm, where non-Judeans were the majority. The circulation of Philip's coins was primarily limited to his territories, with none found within Judea proper. The pattern continued with Herod's grandson Agrippa I, who many minted coins with figural images for non-Judean subjects and coins without figural images for Judean citizens. Agrippa initially ruled over non-Judean territories where he issued coins featuring portraits of Emperor Gaius Caligula, the imperial family, Agrippa himself, and his royal family members. Subsequently, when he assumed authority over Judea, Samaria, and Idumea. Agrippa's coinage for these regions notably lacked figural representations, employing a fringed royal canopy as a non-figural substitute for a portrait. This consistent avoidance of figural images in Judean coinage for a specific audience is evident throughout the historical period. During the Great Revolt in 66 CE, the rebel authorities minted their own coins, featuring various designs devoid of human or animal depictions. These motifs included a chalice, amphora, floral patterns, possibly pomegranate, grape leaves, palm trees with date baskets, and symbols associated with the Sukkot holiday. This avoidance of figural art was not merely a form of anti-Roman protest, but rather a cultural identity marker. Even Agrippa II, a Roman client and opponent of the revolt, produced coins for the Judeans of Sepphoris in 67-68 CE that lacked figural art. These coins included references to Emperor Nero, but omitted his portrait. It is clear that the use of non-figural imagery on these coins was a deliberate choice, despite Agrippa II's Roman affiliation. Furthermore, Roman prefects and procreators who administered Judea throughout the first century CE also refrained from featuring images of emperors, humans, or animals on their coins. Instead, their coinage showcased innocuous symbols such as palm trees, grain, wreaths, and various inanimate objects. Notably, these non-figural coins produced under Roman prefects and procurators in Judea were unique within the Roman Empire. Even under the prefect Pontius Pilate, coins featured cold symbols like the Simpulum and Latius, which though used in Roman religious rituals, did not violate the prohibition against graven images according to Pentateuchal passages. Interestingly, silver and gold coins were not minted in Judean mints during the first century CE. Scholars have debated the reasons for this, but it is undeniable that Judean mints did not produce precious metal coinage. Consequently, silver coins used locally were likely imported from foreign mints. The dominant source source of silver coins in Judea was the Tyrian Mint, which depicted the Tyrian god Melkart, Greek Heracles, on the obverse side, and an eagle on the reverse. Other foreign coins, primarily Roman denarii, also circulated in Judea, bearing images of humans, animals, and Roman deities. These foreign coins were the only silver coins available to Judeans for major financial transactions and temple donations. Despite their figural imagery, this pragmatic behavior among first century Judeans demonstrates their adaptability to the prevailing circumstances. Archaeological evidence from the first century CE reveals a consistent avoidance of figural art on Judean coins, even when neighboring regions or Roman authorities typically included such imagery. This pattern underscores the cultural and religious significance of avoiding graven images among Judeans during this period. Despite practical considerations that sometimes necessitated the use of coins with figural representations, Architectural decorations in Judea, a unique perspective. In addition to examining numismatic evidence, we will now delve into the archaeological remnants of architecture decorations in the first century Judea to gain insights into how individual Judeans and their communities viewed figural art. This exploration allows us to better understand the preferences and attitudes toward imagery within private homes and public structures. In the broader Greco-Roman world surrounding Judea, figural art was a pervasive feature, used 
used extensively to adorn both public and private architecture. Across the Mediterranean, we find images of humans, animals, and mythological creatures adorning various architectural elements, such as floor mosaics, painting on walls, and ceilings, and carvings on columns, in tablatures, and roof anifixes. Figural imagery was undeniably a hallmark of Greco-Roman architectural embellishment. However, first century Judea stands out as a remarkable exception to this prevailing trend. Judean floor mosaics, for instance, either lacked ornamentation entirely or featured geometric or floral designs exclusively, never including depictions of humans, animals, or mythological figures. Prominent examples of first century CE floor mosaics can be found in the private residences of upper city of Jerusalem. These mosaics showcase various designs like multi-petaled rosettes, pomegranates, stylized palmette leaves, and chessboard patterns. Borders were typically rendered in straight lines, wave crest, and triangular sawtooth designs. Occasionally, corners were adorned with spandrels or simple gamma motifs. It's worth noting that the sole instance of a figural image on a first century CE mosaic floor, plausibly linked to Judean owners, is a fragmentary depiction of a fish or possibly a dolphin, and that was found at the bathhouse at Magdala. Similarly, the most notable examples of first century CE painted wall plasters, both frescoes and secco paintings, were discovered in private homes in the upper city of Jerusalem, although similar examples had been found elsewhere in the region, such as Magdala and Lodapara in Galilee. These paintings often featured a scheme that divided the walls into framed rectangular panels, painted with alternating colors. Some panels included wavy lines and striations to create a marble-like effect. Floral designs were also common, featuring clusters of apples and pomegranates among leaves, along with hanging garlands. One architectural motif depicted fluted ionic columns supporting an entablature with a schematic representation of a Doric frieze, complete with treeglyphs and plain metopes. Importantly, these wall paintings consistently lacked depictions of humans or animals. To the best of our knowledge, the only instances of figural art in the first century CE wall paintings are the depictions of birds found in a single private residence on Mount Zion. When we turn our attention to carved stone and molded stucco decorations from the first century CE Judean context, we find that they closely followed Greco-Roman styles but seldom incorporated figural representations. For example, one reception hall in a private house in the upper city of Jerusalem featured walls adorned with stucco arranged in panels mimicking courses of bossed ashlars. The ornamental stucco ceilings in the same room boasted a pattern of triangles, squares, hexagons, and octagons, along with an egg and dart motif. Additionally, a relief carved stone discovered in a synagogue at Magdala showcased architectural elements, utensils, including the seven-branched menorah, amphoras, and an oil lamp, as well as various floral and geometric designs, all without any any figural depictions. These archaeological findings provide a unique glimpse into the artistic preferences and cultural attitudes of first century Judeans. Despite the prevalent use of figural art in the wider Greco-Roman world, Judea maintained a distinctive focus on non-figural designs in its architectural adornments during this period. Funerary Art in Judea, Symbols and Avoidance of Figural Images Judean funerary art in the first century CE comprised various forms of artistic expression including carved decorations on rock-cut tombs, incised designs on ossuaries and sarcophagi, as well as rare paintings on tombs, ossuaries, and wooden coffins, mainly found in the Judean desert. Let's explore the intricate details of these artistic expressions while also noting the significant absence of figural imagery. Rock-cut tombs, both their facades and internal chambers, were often adorned with carved designs meant to mimic architectural features like ashlar walls, columns, both attached and freestanding, entablatures, and occasionally pediments. These carved architectural elements were consistently decorated with geometric and floral motifs. Notably, among the hundreds of first century CE Judean tombs excavated or surveyed, none have been found to contain carvings depicting humans or animals. Ossuaries and sarcophagi, which served as containers for human remains, also displayed ornate carvings or incised designs. These decorations primarily featured geometric patterns, floral motifs, and architectural 
colorful elements. Geometric designs included rosettes, concentric circles, zigzag lines, and chessboard patterns. Floral motifs encompassed various leaves, flowers, fruits, palmettes, wreaths, and garlands, grapevines, and palm trees. Architectural elements often depicted tomb facades, entrances, columns, and ashlar walls. Other motifs included vessels such as an amphorae, cantharae, forgive me if I butchered that, and menorahs. Notably, the no ossuaries or sarcophagi were ornamented with figural art, with the exception of one ossuary featuring schematic outlines of an ox skull, it looks like, a design whose classification as an animal image might be questioned. While much rare paintings found in Judean tombs, ossuaries, and wooden coffins, as well as a graffiti on tomb walls, provide further insights, some surviving fragments of paintings in Judean Shefela region depict geometric and floral designs. Among the best preserved wall paintings are those in the first century CE Judean tomb known as the Goliath tomb in Jericho, featuring masonry, wreaths, grapevines, geometric patterns resembling pergolas, and fragments of three birds. Few ossuaries and wooden coffins from the Judean desert have been discovered with paintings, often displaying garlands, fruits, flowers, branches, rosettas, and simple bands. Graffiti in Jason's tomb in Jerusalem, which remained in use for the first century BCE into the first century CE, includes schematic depictions of ships, seven-branched menorahs, a chalice, a palm branch, and a stag with antlers. Importantly, these instances of birds in the Goliath tomb and the stag in Jason's tomb constitute the sole examples of figural images found in 1st century CE Judean's funerary contexts. Turning to pottery and small finds, the majority consisted of functional items that were typically left undecorated. When ornamentation was present, it typically featured simple incised lines, geometric patterns, and floral designs, almost never figural images of depicting humans or animals. One notable aspect is the avoidance of contemporary Roman lamps decorated with central discusses featuring humans, animals, Animal and mythological images. Judeans favored the use of an unadorned or minimally decorated Herodian lamps instead. Interestingly, a shift toward mold-made lamps with various motifs occurred in the first century CE, including geometric patterns, scrolls, wreaths, grape clusters, pomegranates, rosettas, palm trees, amphorae, menorahs, and symbols related to the festival of Sukkot. While exceedingly rare, some examples of these lamps did incorporate figural imagery, such as birds and fish. Notably, certain copies of these lamps featured disfigured figural images replaced by holes indicating a deliberate effort to alter or avoid such depictions. Rare instances of figural art on small finds include engravings of a fish on a stone tabletop, a bronze fitting shaped like an animal's paw, a bone gaming piece featuring a human hand, and an etching of two sacrificial birds on a chalk core. Figural images on engraved gemstones used as sills, decorative pieces, or amulets were also infrequently found in clearly Judean archaeological contexts. Despite these exceptions, the general pattern observed in Judean funerary art in the first century CE is the avoidance of figural representations in favor of geometric, floral, and architectural motifs. Early evidence of Judean avoidance of figural art. The evidence we've examined thus far leaves no doubt. In the first century CE, Judeans, with only a few exceptions, were refrained from creating artistic representations of humans and animals. Literary sources from this period, especially the writings of Josephus, make it clear that such depictions were considered forbidden by Torah law. In this discussion, we explore whether this practice can be traced back to earlier times. We'll demonstrate that there is strong evidence of Judeans avoiding figural art from the first century BCE and the latter part of the second century BCE, but no evidence exists for earlier periods. Textual evidence from the era of Herod the Great, late 1st century BCE. Josephus recounts a story from the late 1st century BCE about two Judean scholars who, as Herod the Great, fell ill near the end of his life, encouraged their followers to remove a golden eagle that Herod had placed above the great gate of the Jerusalem temple, defying ancestral laws. According to Josephus in War of the Jews, these scholars objected to the 
eagle because it was seen as unlawful to place in the temple either images or busts or any representation whatsoever of a living creature. While this explanation suggests that the prohibition against images applied only to the temple, in antiquities, Josephus described the prohibition more broadly. The law forbids those who intend to live in accordance with it to think of setting up images or making depictions of the likeness of any living creature. In war, Josephus also mentions that about 40 young men involved in removing the eagle were caught, and when brought before Herod and asked who had ordered them to carry out this act, simply replied, the ancestral law. In antiquities, Josephus has these men explain at length their actions were in accordance with the law that Moses wrote as God prompted and taught him and left behind. The question arises, which specific precept of the Mosaic law did the golden eagle above the temple's gate as a donation violate. In antiquities, Josephus describes the eagle as Herod's anathema, a Greek term denoting a votive offering donated to the temple. Nowhere does it imply that any Judeans regarded the eagle as an idol to be worshipped. By the time of this incident, the eagle had presumably been hanging above the temple gate for some time, and everyone recognized it as an ornamental sculpture with certain ideological significance, no doubt, but certainly not as an idol worthy of worship. Therefore, it appears that the eagle was not viewed as a violation of the first commandment of the Decalogue, which prohibited the worship of foreign gods, but rather as a violation of the second commandment, which forbade the creation of graven images depicting living creatures, regardless of whether these images were objects of worship. Figural art in these earlier sources. While Judean literary sources before the Herodian era certainly reveal an awareness of common Judean aversion to idolatry, earlier sources do not seem to provide clear evidence of prohibition against figural art that was not intended for worship. We won't delve into all the biblical sources that strongly condemn the worship of deities represented in physical form. What's noteworthy is that none of these texts seem to be aware of a ban against non-worshipped figural artwork, artistic depictions of humans or animals for secular purposes. On the contrary, as we've seen, the authors of texts in both Kings and Chronicles speak rather favorably of the twelve molten bulls that Solomon casts as supports for his molten sea as well as the sculpted lions adorning his grand ivory throne. Solomon's temple is even described as filled with sculpted and embroidered images of bulls, lions, and winged cherubim, none of which seem to have incurred the displeasure of the biblical authors. Herod the Great's time. In the first century CE, there was a distinct lack of artistic representations of people and animals in the archaeological findings of the era. This absence of figurative art was also evident during the reign of Herod the Great. Herod's coins, much like those from the first century CE, purposely avoided depicting individuals such as Augustus, the imperial family, Herod himself, or his royal family. Instead, they featured various symbols and objects. Similarly, the palaces built by Herod discovered at locations like Caesarea Maritima, Jericho, Cyprus, Herodium, Masada, and Machaerus rarely contain figural art. Even when ornate mosaic floors were uncovered, they typically displayed geometric patterns or floral designs. Paintings on the palace walls followed the artistic styles popular in the contemporary Roman world, but omitted figurative motifs. Only a couple of instances of rooms with figural images have been found, such as frescoes with birds in a bathhouse at Upper Herodium, and scenes with humans and animals in a royal theater box. Even Herod's construction projects on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem were devoid of figurative elements, featuring only geometric and floral designs. Similarly, smaller artifacts from the late 1st century BCE, like oil lamps and clay medallions, mostly lacked figurative images. A rare, or few rare exceptions, included lamps with possible human faces and a clay medallion depicting a woman's bust. These findings suggest a deliberate avoidance of figurative art during Herod's time, both in public and private settings, reflecting the cultural and religious preferences of the period. The Hasmonean era. The Judean coinage during the Hasmonean period, which peaked between 134 to 37 BCE, is distinctive for its lack of human or animal figures. Instead, these coins typically featured various symbols, like a double cornucopia with what looks like a pomegranate, as well as other designs such as a 
flower, a palm frond, a military helmet, an anchor, and a star-shaped motif. One notable innovation came from the last Hasmonean ruler, Metathias Antigonus, who depicted temple vessels on his coins, a seven-branched menorah on one side and the table of the showbread on the other. What sets these Hasmonean coins apart is the prominent use of texts. They bear inscriptions, densely covered much of the coin's surface, providing the ruler's name and title along with references to the Assembly of the Judeans. This was a deliberate attempt to convey the image of the Hasmonean leader without resorting to a graphic representation. This is quite unique, as there are no comparable coins from the Hellenistic world of that time that entirely replace a ruler's image with text. The underlying message here is clear. These coins reflect a commitment to the Torah's ban on images, supported by the political leadership. Interestingly, one of the earliest Hasmonean coins doesn't even mention a Judean ruler, but rather a Seleucid king, Antiochus VII Eurgetes. These coins were minted in Jerusalem shortly after John Hyrcanus assumed leadership of the Hasmonean polity. Another coin type from the same period displays a helmet and an aphlaston on the reverse side, both surrounded by Greek inscriptions referring to King Antiochus. These coins were likely struck by Hyrcanus to appease his Seleucid overlord. The absence of the Seleucid king's image, replaced by a text bearing his name and title, highlights the Judean aversion to figurative images. Notably, figurative art is absent not only from Hasmonean coins, but also from the palaces at Jericho and the Judean desert, which foreshadowed later Herodian palaces. These sites feature the first known non-figural mosaic floors in the region, dating to the mid-1st century BCE. In fact, I'm not aware of any examples of Judean material culture from this era, whether in domestic, public, or funerary context, that include incorporate images of humans or animals. During the Seleucid and Ptolemaic periods, there are fewer archaeological findings associated with Judeans compared to the later Hasmonean and Herodian periods. One notable discovery is the monumental structure found in Iraq, El Emir in Transjordan. This structure includes a frieze adorned with large sculptures of lions and eagles, as well as fountains shaped like sculpted lions. Scholars commonly link this construction to the fortress described by Josephus, which was built by the Judean aristocrat Hyrcanus, son of Joseph, in the early 2nd century BCE. Josephus mentioned that this fortress featured beasts of gigantic gigantic size. Before the time of John Hyrcanus I, there is a gap of over a hundred years during which no coins were minted in Judea. Prior to this gap, Judean coins from the reigns of the first two Ptolemaic kings dating to the first half of the 3rd century BCE are known. These silver coins typically displayed the portrait of either the king or queen on one side and a standing eagle on the other, accompanied by an inscription in Paleo-Hebrew script reading Yehuda. These coins are believed to have been minted by Judeans in Jerusalem, but under the influence of the Ptolemaic authorities, it remains uncertain whether the Judean mentors had any reservations about including these images on their coins. Dr. Jonathan Adler's book is fantastic. He has so many more sources and goes into way more depth. I highly recommend anyone to get the book. The Persian era in ancient Judea. The earliest known Judean coins date back to the 4th century BCE during the final phases of the Achaemenid rule. The these coins feature various images of humans and animals and are identified as Judean due to inscriptions in Paleo-Hebrew or Aramaic script. These inscriptions typically mention the province of Yehud or the names of Judean officials such as Jonathan the priest or Jezekiah the governor. Some of these coins designs were inspired by Athenian coins featuring the head of Athena and her attributes. Other motifs on Judean coins include eagles, bearded men, lions, and mythological creatures. These coins were minted by Judean officials, including priests and governors. In addition to coins, lion stamps were used to mark storage jars in Judea, possibly for administrative purposes like taxation. These stamps dated to either the late 6th century BCE under Babylonian rule or the early Persian period. Later stamps featured inscriptions mentioning the province of Yehud and Judean officials, but lacked pictorial elements. 
Terracotta figurines depicting humans and animals have been found at some Judean sites during the Persian period. However, the number of these figurines is relatively small compared to other regions in the southern Levant. Some scholars suggest this may indicate a shift towards a more exclusive and aniconic worship of Yahweh among Judeans. But it's unlikely that this reflects a prohibition against figurative art, especially given the presence of figurative images on contemporary coins. A few artifacts from Persian-era Judea depicts foreign deities such as the goddess Astarte and the Egyptian god Osiris. Greek deities are also represented on some jar handles with gemstone impressions. These findings suggest a degree of cultural exchange and diversity in religious iconography. Outside Judea, among the Judeans in Babylonia, seals from Merushu archive dating from 455 to 403 BCE have been discovered. These seals associated with Judean individuals feature various figurative motifs, including humans, animals, and mythological creatures. Another Judean seal from the Yehuda archive dating to the late 6th century BCE depicts a worshiper before symbols of Marduk and Ishtar. In summary, during the Persian era in Judea, there was a variety of coin designs, the use of lion stamps, terracotta figurines, and artifacts depicting both local and foreign religious imagery, reflecting the complex cultural and religious landscape of the time. Here's the conclusion on figural art. We have delved into the question of whether Judeans began to abstain from creating visual representations of humans and animals in their artwork following what was perceived as a directive from Torah law. The evidence suggests a notable shift in artistic practices among Judeans in the first century CE. During this period, Judeans produced various forms of art that conspicuously avoided depicting humans or animals, with only a few exceptions. This trend is particularly evident in the coin designs used locally by Judeans, where images of emperors and Judean rulers were consistently absent. Literary sources, including the works of Josephus, provide a clear explanation for this archaeological pattern, a widespread belief among Judeans that Torah law prohibited the artistic representation of living creatures. This practice of adhering to the prohibition can be traced back to the 1st century BCE and the final decades of the 2nd century BCE, when Judeans minted coins that intentionally omitted figurative depictions. Before this period, there was a significant hiatus in Judean coins minting and limiting archaeological findings associated with Judeans, both of which displayed minimal artistic elements, whether figurative or non-figurative. Going further back in time, we encounter coins from the early 3rd century BCE that featured portraits of Ptolemaic monarchs and an eagle. Even earlier in the 4th century BCE, Judean authorities produced a wide array of coins that consistently featured images of animals and humans. Importantly, these choices in coin imagery were not influenced by Persian directives, indicating that figural art did not pose a problem for Judeans in the late Persian period. Terracotta figurines and Judean seals with figurative elements from the Archimenid times further support this conclusion. This observation aligns with the scholarly consensus that from the Hasmonean era onward, there was a noticeable aversion to figural art among Judeans. Various theories had been proposed to explain the shift, including the influence of Sadducees or Pharisees a reaction against Hellenization, and a response to the events of 167 BCE, such as the desecration of the temple by Antiochus IV. However, these theories lack sufficient evidence to be conclusively supported. A more plausible explanation, as suggested by some scholars, is that the ban on figural art was initiated by the Hasmoneans, whose political and military policies were influenced by the Book of Deuteronomy, which emphasized the avoidance of images. This prohibition served as a boundary marker between Jews and non-Jews. Rather than viewing the prohibition on figural images in isolation, it is worth considering the possibility that adherence to this prohibition reflects a broader commitment to Torah laws in general. The evidence represented here offers a precise terminus antiquem, a limit before which. For when this shift may have occurred around 131 BCE, when imageless coins bearing the name of Antiochus VII were minted in Judea. Prior to this, there is insufficient evidence to determine whether Judeans were actively seeking to adhere to the Pentateuchal ban on images. Over two centuries earlier, during the Persian era, Judean authorities demonstrated no concern whatsoever for such a prohibition, as they included figurative images on all their minted coins. Tephilim and Mezuzat In Deuteronomy 5, 1-6, 
3 and 11, Moses instructs the Israelites to keep certain words close to their hearts and to regularly discuss them, especially with children. These words, possibly referring to the Horeb Theophany, or commandments to love Yahweh, should be 1. Held in the heart. 2. Taught to children. 3. Discussed at all times. 4. Symbolically tied to the hand. 5. Placed between the eyes. And 6. Written on house doorposts and gates. This directive is echoed in Exodus 13, focusing on rituals like the festival of unleavened bread and the redemption of the firstborn. These passages influenced two first century Judean practices, wearing tefillin and placing mezuzah. Tefillin involved binding small animal skin cases with Pentateuchal text on the body, specifically on the hand or arm and forehead, following the instruction to have a sign on the hand and a reminder between the eyes. Mezuzot referred to inscribing Pentateuchal passages on doorways, growing from the command to write these words on doorposts and gates. This chapter, or section, examines the literary and archaeological evidence of these practices in the first century CE, tracing their origins and development over time. Textual evidence, Philo of Alexandria. Philo interprets the Deuteronomy passages allegorically. He sees the command to bind rules of justice on the hand as a symbol of action and suggests that these rules should always be in sight, close to the eyes. His interpretation seems more metaphorical than indicative of a specific physical practice. However, regarding the command to write on doorposts, Philo envisions a literal practice of placing engraved plaques or writings at the entrances of houses, which aligns with the concept of mezuzot. The Gospel according to Matthew Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, there's a mention of the phylacteria, commonly translated as phylacteries, when criticizing Pharisees and scribes for their showy piety. This reference has been interpreted to mean tefillin, although Matthew may have actually referred to the protective cases used for tefillin rather than the amulets themselves, highlighting their use as a display of devotion. Josephus provides a more detailed account, diverging from simple paraphrasing of biblical texts. He describes a practice where words, possibly related to God's power and benevolence, are physically inscribed and worn on the arm and head. This description closely resembles the practice of wearing tefillin, suggesting a concrete, visible ritual rather than a purely metaphorical one. These literary sources, though not extensive, hint at an existence and nature of tefillin and mezuzah practices in the first century. Philo's allegorical interpretations in the Gospel of Matthew's possible reference to tefillin cases suggests a metaphorical and physical aspect of these practices. Josephus provides a more direct reference indicating a physical manifestation of these rituals that aligns with what is known about tefillin. Collectively, these sources along with archaeological evidence offer a glimpse into the religious life and practices of first century Judeans. Now let's turn to archaeological evidence. The primary discoveries include small leather cases and thin animal skin slips with Pentateuchal patterns. Passages. These were mainly found near Kerbet Qumran, with a smaller number from other Judean desert locations. The dating of these artifacts suggests they are around 68 CE, with some possibly from the 132 to 135 CE Bar Kokhba revolt. Characteristics of the artifacts, the leather cases were designed to hold the inscripted slips. Some cases were found with slips still inside, while others were empty. The slips contain selected passages from Exodus and Deuteronomy, focusing on verses that instruct to Bind a sign upon the hand and between the eyes. The small size of the slips and their storage in sealed cases indicate they were not intended for reading but for ritual use. Interpretation as Tefillin The presence of straps on the cases implies they were designed to be worn on the body. The specific text chosen for these slips, along with their method of storage, suggests a literal interpretation of biblical verses commanding the binding of certain words on the hands and forehead. This practice, known as Tefillin, is evidenced to predate rabbinic times, showing a long-standing tradition of interpreting and implementing these biblical instructions. The archaeological evidence from the Judean desert offers a tangible link to the ancient practice of tefillin, underscoring its historical roots and meticulous approach to religious observance in first century Judean society. These findings not only confirm the existence of the practice, but also provide insights into the religious and cultural context of the period. Honestly, you gotta get Dr. Adler's book because it goes into much more depth and detail on sources and evidence to show this is the case. 
Now let's turn to understanding ancient interpretations of religious law through Tefillin. Tefillin are ancient Jewish artifacts that provide insights into how religious instructions from the Torah were interpreted long ago. By examining these artifacts, we can trace back the thought processes of ancient Judean scholars. The way Tefillin are designed, with different compartments for holding scriptural slips, reveals much about these interpretations. For example, the Torah instructs that words should be bound as a sign on the hand and as a remembrance between the eyes. From this, we can infer that tefillin with a single compartment were likely worn on the hand while those with multiple compartments were worn on the forehead. This idea is not new. It aligns with ancient Jewish legal texts suggesting a long-standing tradition. Moreover, all tefillin found in the Judean desert contain one or more of four specific verses from the Torah showing a consistent practice. However, there's variation in the additional verses included indicating different approaches to interpreting the Torah. Some tefillin contain only the specific sections where tefillin wearing is mandated, reflecting a literal interpretation. Others include verses from preceding sections suggesting an attempt to understand the broader context and original intent behind these laws. These variations highlight the diverse ways ancient Judeans engaged with and interpreted their religious laws. Studying these artifacts helps us appreciate the rich history of religious thought and practice in ancient Jewish culture. Maurice Bellit, and I probably butchered her name, forgive me, identified a scroll from Qumran Cave 8 as a mezuzah due to its textual content and physical characteristics. Despite differences from traditional rabbinic mezuzah text, Joseph Malik found additional text in Qumran Cave 4 distinguishing these mezuzah from tefillin based on skin thickness and quality. However, the classification of these texts as mezuzah is debated as they contain content more typical of tefillin. The absence of archaeological evidence for first century mezuzah practices in the Judean desert suggests such rituals if practiced, left no surviving trace. The use of perishable materials or wooden door jams for mezuzah inscriptions could explain the lack of physical remains, leading to the conclusion that inscribing mezuzah text on stone was not common practice among first century Judeans. Before we go into earlier evidence of these practices, we have seen that in the first century, the practice of tefillin observance was in full swing. Though the practice of mezuzah may be less certain, it is very likely the practice was happening in the first century, but we shouldn't be certain. Earlier textual evidence. Letter of Aristius. This ancient letter describes Jewish dietary and purity laws. It mentions symbolic reminders on clothing, gates, and doors, possibly referring to biblical instructions about fringes on clothes and teachings on doorposts. The letter diverges from the original biblical text mentioning sayings on doors, not doorposts, and binding a sign on hands, but not between the eyes. This deviation raises questions about the writer's knowledge of rituals like mezuzah, door post scriptures, and tefillin, phylacteries worn on the body. Septuagint. This Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible offers mostly straightforward translations of relevant passages. However, its interpretation of a phrase about keeping divine words between your eyes suggests a metaphorical understanding, possibly referring to constant mental focus on these teachings. A textual variation introduces ambiguity, with some versions implying a tangible object near the eyes, but it's unclear whether this indicates Kate's knowledge of Tefillin-like practice. Hebrew Bible. Beyond the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, there are no clear references to Tefillin or mezuzah-like rituals. Proverbs 6, 20-22 metaphorically speaks of binding ethical teachings of parents on one's heart and neck, indicating moral teachings should always be kept in mind. But this doesn't suggest a concrete ritual practice. While these texts hint at practices similar to Tefillin and Mezuzah, their interpretations and implications are not straightforward. The letter of Aristius might be our earliest text suggesting these rituals, though its differences from biblical instructions and the ambiguity in the Septuagint's translation leave room for debate about the existence and nature of these practices in earlier times. Let's look at earlier archaeological evidence. In the Judean desert, archaeologists and epigraphic experts have uncovered significant and artifacts related to the practices of Tefillin and Mezuzah. These items were discovered in caves near Qumran, alongside other relics that date back to around 68 CE, when Kerbet Qumran was abandoned. Interestingly, Tefillin discovered in different Judean desert caves were found with artifacts dating as late as the Bar Kokhba revolt. While it's possible that some of these artifacts might have been created before the first century CE, this hasn't been definitively proven. These artifacts haven't undergone radiocarbon analyses due to 
their small size and the destructive nature of such tests. Instead, scholars rely on paleographic analyses of the inscribed letter forms to estimate their age. Unfortunately, only limited paleographic analyses have been conducted on the Tefillin texts, mainly relying on initial observations made by the original discoverers. While some Qumran finds have been dated to the first century CE based on paleographic analyses, others argue that the script closely resembles that of the second and first centuries BCE, which continued without significant changes until the middle of the first century CE. If this assessment is accurate, it could suggest that some Tefillin and mezuzah slips were prepared as early as the Hasmonean period. The Nash Papyrus. Another significant artifact is the Nash Papyrus, acquired from an Egyptian antiquities dealer who claimed it was found in the Fayim region. This papyrus primarily contains a harmonized version of the Decalogue from Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, along with a Hebrew version of Deuteronomy 6.3, which is present in the Septuagint but missing from the Masoretic text, followed by Deuteronomy 6.4, although the lower part of the papyrus is missing. Due to its textual content and physical resemblance to the Qumran Tefillin and Mezuzah, some scholars have suggested it might be a Tefillin slip or a Mezuzah. The papyrus has been dated paleographically to the mid-2nd century BCE until the mid-1st century BCE. If this date and its identification as a Tefillin or Mezuzah are accurate, both are uncertain. The Nash papyrus could represent one of the earliest known artifacts associated with these practices. Evidence before the 2nd century BCE no artifacts conclusively connected to Tefillin or mezuzah practices predate the 2nd century BCE. While some scholars have attempted to find potential precursors in various amuletic practices from the Iron Age in Near East, these connections are not strong. The closest resemblance is found in two silver plaques discovered at Katif Hinnom, which contain apotropaic formulae similar to the priestly blessings in Numbers 6, 24 through 26. However, beyond their small size and textual similarity, there isn't sufficient reason to consider these artifacts as early evidence of Judean ritual practices like Tefillin or Mezuzah. The evidence presented in this section supports the existence of Tefillin and Mezuzah as Judean ritual practices in the first century CE. While it's challenging to determine how widespread these practices were, the Tefillin remains from the Judean desert provide valuable insights into the details of these rituals and their development. Different types of Tefillin found in the caves suggest that Judean legal experts were acting debating the finer points of the ritual, shedding light on the development of Torah as a legal system during this period. However, evidence for these practices before the first century CE is less certain and dates back to no earlier than the second century BCE. There is no evidence of any practice resembling Tefillin or mezuzah observance prior to the middle of the second century BCE. Miscellaneous Practices in contrast to the previous sections, which focused on specific categories of customs and prohibitions, this section will explore six distinct practices characterized Judaism in the first century CE. These practices are circumcision, observing the Sabbath, participating in the Passover sacrifice, and the festival of unleavened bread, fasting on the Day of Atonement, engaging in the central rites or rituals of the Sukkot festival, dwelling in temporary booths, and using certain plant species and maintaining a continuously lit seven-branched menorah in the Jerusalem temple. In each case, we will examine evidence from the first century CE and then examine earlier periods. Circumcision in the first century CE. Circumcision is mentioned in the Pentateuch as one of the commandments dating back to Abraham, with a requirement for every male child to be circumcised on the eighth day. Failure to comply with this command carried severe consequences, including being cut off from the community. This practice extended not only to infants, and purchased slaves, but also to resident aliens who wished to partake in the Passover sacrifice. In the writings of first century CE authors, both Jews and non-Jews recognize circumcision as a prominent marker of all Jewish identity. For Jewish individuals, it was not just a cultural trait, but a fulfillment of a divine commandment outlined in the Torah. Philo and Paul, for instance, referred to circumcision as a commandment of the law, and Paul argued that it should not be imposed on Gentiles. Acts mentioned circumcision as part of the custom 
custom of Moses, while the Gospel of John depicted Jesus defending the practice even on the Sabbath. Josephus recounted an ancient, Josephus recounted an incident where a Gentile king's refusal to circumcise was seen as a grave offense against God. For first century CE Jews, circumcision was primarily a commandment of the Torah, and its abandonment was considered a serious legal transgression. While other groups practiced circumcision during this time, Jews were unique in doing so based on a statutory law. Early Evidence of Circumcision The earliest non-Jewish reference to Jewish circumcision comes from the mid-first century BCE, author Diodorus Siculus. Even earlier, Jewish sources mention circumcision in the context of the Hasmonean rulers, Hyrcanus I and Aristobulus I who enforce circumcision on conquered peoples. In texts likely dating from the Hasmonean period, circumcision is described in legal terms in Jubilees. Theodotus, another writer from this period, cited the story of circumcision in Genesis 34 as a divine mandate. The practice of circumcision is prominently featured in the narrative surrounding the reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes in 1st and 2nd Maccabees, with instances of renegade Jews forsaking circumcision and later forcibly circumcising uncircumcised boys. Daniel 11 may also allude to Antiochene decrees against circumcision, suggesting its prevalence by this time. However, it's possible that the Holy Covenant in this context refers to broader elements of the Divine Covenant such as the people and the temple. Closer to the beginning of the 2nd century BCE, Ben Sira emphasized Abraham's obedience to divine commandments including circumcision, but it's unclear how widespread this belief was among the Jewish population. Prior to the 2nd century BCE, there's no evidence outside of the Pentateuch for the idea of circumcision as a fulfillment of divine command, a legally mandated practice, or its association with a legal framework. Circumcision was likely a cultural practice among early Israelites, but it may have predated any distinct Israelite identity and was later incorporated into Pentateuchal legislation. Sabbath Prohibitions in the First Century In the ancient Jewish tradition, the seventh day of the week, known as the Sabbath, was a day of rest, and it was prohibited to engage in any form of work. While the foundational texts like the Pentateuch mention this prohibition, they only provided a few specific examples of what activities were forbidden, such as plowing, reaping, kindling fire, gathering wood, and leaving one's place. By the first century CE, the observance of Sabbath prohibitions had become a defining feature of Jewish life, both among Jewish communities and non-Jewish observers throughout the Mediterranean region. Jewish writers of that time grappled with questions about what exactly constituted work that should be avoided on the Sabbath and under what circumstances exceptions could be made. For instance, the philosopher Philo extensively discussed the symbolic and ethical significance of observing the Sabbath, emphasizing the importance of following the practical laws associated with it. He criticized those who focused solely on the symbolic aspects while neglecting the actual observance of Sabbath laws, such as lighting fires, working the land, carrying heavy loads, conducting legal proceedings, and other activities that were generally considered prohibited. Philo's writings suggest that most Jews took the observance of the Sabbath laws seriously, and even the Roman Emperor Augustus respected Jewish Sabbath practices, ensuring that the distribution of financial assistance in Rome would not occur on Saturdays, when Sabbath observance was at its strictest. Philo also recounted a story about a governor in Egypt who attempted to compel Jewish residents to work on the Sabbath, but this met with widespread resistance and outrage among the Jewish community. In the New Testament Gospels, stories about the Sabbath shed light on the boundaries of Sabbath prohibitions. Jesus, for example, was said to permit healing on the Sabbath and defended his followers who engaged in activities like plucking grain or carrying a mat on the Sabbath. However, he also recognized certain activities as universally permissible on the Sabbath, including the temple rituals, rescuing individuals or animals in need, and circumcision. The prohibition against working on the Sabbath is also discussed in the writings of Josephus, particularly in the context of military activities activities. Josephus grappled with the question of when it was permissible to break the Sabbath for warfare, and his experiences as a commander during the Great Revolt likely influenced his views. Josephus also mentioned the prohibition against traveling on the Sabbath and described a debate between the Essenes and other Jews about the strictness of Sabbath observance. Finally, various non-Jewish sources from the first century mentioned Jewish Sabbath observance, often in a critical or derogatory manner. This widespread awareness of Jewish Sabbath 
Sabbath practices among non-Jews underscores the significance and prevalence of Sabbath observance during that time. A recent study examined Sabbath observance among a small Jewish community in Edfu, Egypt during the first century CE. The study found that while regular taxes were sometimes the study found that while regular taxes were sometimes collected from Jews on the Sabbath, the special Judean tax imposed after the Great Revolt was almost never collected on a Sabbath. This suggests that regular tax collection was handled by non-Jews, while Jews themselves refrained from collecting the Judean tax on the Sabbath. Earlier evidence of Sabbath observance and prohibitions, we have substantial historical evidence from the 1st and 2nd centuries BCE that shows the widespread observance of Sabbath prohibitions within the Judean community. These prohibitions specified what activities were not allowed on the Sabbath day, which was the seventh day of the week. However, during this period, there were debates and discussions among various individuals and groups regarding the exact rules and boundaries of these Sabbath laws. In the first century BCE, the historian Josephus mentions several letters and decrees issued by Roman officials. These directives instructed cities across the Mediterranean region to grant the local Judean communities the freedom to practice their Sabbath laws without interference. Some of the activities explicitly mentioned as forbidden on the Sabbath included legal proceedings like appearing in court, carrying weapons, and military marching. Josephus also recounted that during Pompey's attack on Jerusalem in 63 BCE, the Roman general took advantage of the Sabbath to build fortifications around the city, as Judeans typically only fought in self-defense on that day. These Sabbath prohibitions were not only present in historical records, but also appeared in texts dating from the last two centuries BCE. For example, the Book of Jubilees listed specific actions that were prohibited on the Sabbath, such as moving items between houses, preparing food and drink, traveling by ship or animal, hunting, slaughtering animals, engaged in warfare, having sexual intercourse, and even discussing work-related matters. The Damascus document provided further details on Sabbath prohibitions, including activities forbidden from Friday afternoon when the sun reached a certain point in the sky. These restrictions ranged from refraining from empty or disgraceful speech to not demanding payments from neighbors and much more. The writer Aristobulus from the mid-2nd century BCE emphasized the importance of the seventh day as a day of rest mandated by Judean law. He believed that observing the Sabbath was a way to gain knowledge of both human and divine matters. The books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees contain stories illustrating the complexities surrounding Sabbath observance. In some cases, devout Judeans chose not to fight in self-defense on the Sabbath, even when attacked. However, there were instances when they decided that self-defense on the Sabbath was necessary to ensure their survival. The earliest non-Judean references to Judean Sabbath observance came from Agatharsides. The earliest non-Judean reference to Judean Sabbath observance came from Agatharchides of, of Nidus in the mid-2nd century BCE, who described the Judean custom of abstaining from work on the seventh day. This concept of Judeans observing Sabbath prohibitions became a common theme among Greek and Latin authors from the 1st century BC onwards. One interesting historical artifact is a papyrus from the 3rd century BCE known as the Zenon Papyri, which mentions the term Sabbath in the context of a day when certain individuals refrain from work. Whether this this referred to a traditional Judean holiday or a weekly Sabbath observance is not entirely clear. While there are accounts of Sabbath observance in these historical sources, it is important to note that the idea of Sabbath prohibitions was not widely practiced or known before the 2nd century BCE. The Hebrew Bible contains very few narratives about Judeans refraining from certain activities on the Sabbath, and the concept of the seven-day week itself was not commonly used for timekeeping until the late 2nd century BCE. It wasn't until the mid-2nd century BCE that we see a significant shift towards widespread observance of Sabbath prohibitions among Judeans. Prior to this, there is little evidence to suggest that the general population was aware of or adhering to such prohibitions. Passover and the Festival of Unleavened Bread in the 1st century CE In the book of Exodus chapter 12, we find instructions from Yahweh, the Hebrew God, to Moses and Aaron regarding the observance of Passover on the eve of the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. These instructions Instructions include selecting a one-year-old male lamb or kid on the 10th day of the first month, slaughtering it on the 14th day, marking the doorposts of the houses with its blood, and then eating the roasted meat along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs on the same night. Yahweh emphasizes that this Passover sacrifice should be observed for all generations as an 
ongoing ordinance. Detailed guidelines are provided on various aspects of the ritual, such as who should perform it, how it should be done, what should be done with the leftovers. Additionally, instructions are given in the other parts of the Pentateuch, including allowances for impure individuals or those on distant journeys. Connected to the Passover sacrifice is the Festival of Unleavened Bread, lasting seven days from the 15th to the 21st day of the first month. During this festival, leaven and leavened bread are prohibited and unleavened bread is to be consumed. The first and last days of the festival are designated as holy convocations when no work is to be done. Detailed instructions about special sacrifices and libations during this period are provided in Numbers 28, 19 through 24. Historical evidence suggests that both the Passover sacrifice and the festival of unleavened bread were widely practiced by Judeans in the first century CE. Philo, a Jewish philosopher of that time, described the Passover rituals mentioning that many myriads of sacrifices were offered from noon until evening, involving people of all ages, not just priests. He also noted that every household resembled a temple during this time. While Philo may have been describing practices in Judaism, some believe he could have been referencing practices practices in Alexandria. Josephus, a historian at that time as well, reported a massive census during the Passover season where 255,600 animals were slaughtered for the Passover sacrifice. He estimated that over two and a half million participants were involved, including Judeans from abroad. These accounts support Philo's description of widespread Passover observance. The Synoptic Gospels also highlight the importance of Passover. Jesus and his disciples observed a Passover meal, where bread and hymns were part of the celebration. This suggests that Passover observance was common among contemporary Judeans. Passover and the festival of unleavened bread appear as prominent events in gospel accounts and in Acts, marking significant dates in the Judean calendar. The prohibition against leaving, the prohibition against leaven during this feast was also known among non-Judeans, as indicated by the historian Tacitus, who mentioned the use of unleavened Judean bread in memory of their hasty departure from Egypt. Earlier evidence. In 4 BCE, during the Passover and Festival of Unleavened Bread, a significant gathering of Jewish people took place in Jerusalem, involving numerous animal sacrifices. This event was mentioned by historian Josephus. However, this account lacks the details needed to determine whether it's accurately reflecting practices from the mid-first century BCE. During the Hasmonean period, there's limited information about the observance of Passover-related practices. Some texts mention details about Passover and unleavened bread laws, but they do not provide a clear picture of how widespread these observances were during that time. On the other hand, certain legal texts from the 2nd and 1st centuries BCE offer valuable insights into how Judean scholars were interpreting and applying the Pentateuchal laws to establish specific rules for these festivals. For example, the Book of Jubilees specifies when and where the Passover should be observed and who should participate. These texts also suggest age and gender restrictions. Before the 2nd century BCE, the Hebrew Bible is the primary source of information regarding practices resembling the Passover sacrifice and the festival of unleavened bread. Some narratives in the Bible describe large-scale Passover observances, but the historical accuracy of these accounts is uncertain. The lack of concrete evidence has led to various theories about the origins of these festivals, with most hypotheses suggesting the existence of two distinct springtime agricultural or shepherding festivals that eventually merged into the Passover and unleavened bread. However, these theories are largely speculative and lack substantiated evidence. The earliest solid evidence for widespread observance of the Passover and the Festival of Unleavened Bread comes from Josephus' accounts of events that occurred at the Temple Mount in the 1st century BCE and CE. While some Hasmonean era texts indicate scholarly engagement with the festival's laws, the extent of practical observance during that time remains uncertain. Biblical narratives provide insights into how the festivals were envisioned by individual writers but not offer concrete evidence of their widespread practice. The epigraphic material from Elephantine provides some evidence of Passover observance, but lacks sufficient detail to draw definitive conclusions about its alignment with Pentateuchal regulations. Exploring Passover at Elephantine 
In our investigation, we come across intriguing mentions of Passover in ancient Elephantine, specifically two letters inscribed on pieces of pottery known as ostraca, allude to Passover-related matters. The first letter, addressed to someone named Hoshaya, forgive me if I mispronounced that, contains a request for information about when Passover would be observed. However, it does not provide any details about the nature of this Passover observance, and it hints that the date for Passover may not have been fixed. The second ostracon, though fragmented, contains a request suggesting an individual's intention to participate in the Passover observance. Again, it lacks specifics about the nature of this Passover celebration. It appears that Passover may have been a subject of interest or discussion among the community, but the exact customs and rituals associated with it remain unclear. A third letter written on papyrus does not mention Passover explicitly, but refers to a period between the 15th and 21st days of a month, potentially Nisan, which aligns with the time Time frame of the biblical festival of unleavened bread. However, this letter is also vague, providing no details about the observed practices during this period. Scholars have attempted to interpret these fragments, assuming they relate to Passover and the festival of unleavened bread, based on the timing mentioned. They have drawn on biblical and rabbinic sources to reconstruct missing parts of the text and clarify unclear phrases. For example, they have inferred. For example, they have inferred instructions related to the observance of Passover on the 14th day of Nisan eating unleavened bread for seven days, maintaining ritual purity, refraining from work on specific days, avoiding leavened products, and removing leaven from households. However, it's crucial to note that these reconstructions heavily rely on later biblical and rabbinic sources. Scholars have applied these known practices to the Elephantine texts, and in doing so, they risk circular reasoning. In other words, the interpretations and reconstructions are based on the same sources they seek to validate, making it challenging to establish independent evidence. The Elephantine text offer tantalizing hints, Passover observance, and the festival of unleavened bread, but they lack explicit details. Any attempt to reconstruct these practices relies heavily on later religious texts and regulations, which can lead to circular reasoning. While these ancient texts shed light on the cultural context of Elephantine, they do not provide definitive evidence of Passover customs as practiced at that time. The Day of Atonement Fast, Evidence from the First Century in ancient times, there was a significant religious observance known as the Day of Atonement. This special day was mandated in the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Hebrew Bible again. It occurred on the tenth day of the seventh month and was considered the Sabbath of Sabbaths. On this day, people were forbidden from working, and they were required to engage in some form of self-torment described as afflicting yourselves. The consequences for not observing this self-affliction were severe, as one could be cut off from their people. The purpose of the Day of Atonement was to purify the people of their sins before the deity Yahweh, making it a significant religious occasion. By the first century CE, it seems that there was consensus among Jewish population that the self-affliction mentioned in the Pentateuch should be carried out through fasting. This practice was widespread and well documented. Philo, a Jewish philosopher, wrote about it, highlighting that even those who were not known for their piety observed the fast on the tenth day. Similarly, Josephus, a Jewish historian, referred to this day as a universal fast to honor God. The author of the biblical book of Acts also mentioned mentioned the fast as a common reference, indicating its familiarity to the readers. The Day of Atonement was not only known within Jewish community, but also recognized by Greek and Latin authors, although some of them confused it with the weekly Sabbath. Earlier Evidence Early evidence from the first century BCE and later suggests that the Day of Atonement fast was practiced during this period. For instance, Josephus recounted an incident involving a high priest named Matthias, who was temporarily replaced on the day before the fast due to dream-related issue. This story suggests that the fast was observed around the end of the first century BCE. Among the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Pesher Habakkuk text is the earliest surviving reference to the fast on the Day of Atonement. It tells of a conflict between two individuals on that holy day, mentioning the fasting aspect. While the exact date of this text's composition is uncertain, it likely dates back to this period. The Damascus document also hints at a day of the fast, likely referring to the Day of Atonement, though it is not explicitly stated. Several other texts from the Hasmonean period mention the Day of Atonement 
but do not explicitly mention fasting. Interestingly, prior to the Hasmonean period, there is no documented evidence of the Day of Atonement outside of the Pentateuch. Several biblical texts from the Persian period and later show no awareness of such a holiday. For example, Solomon's dedication of the altar and the Sukkot festival in 2 Chronicles, the rediscovery of Sukkot in Nehemiah, and the construction of an altar in Ezra make no mention of the Day of Atonement. The practice of an annual fast on the Day of Atonement was widespread among Jews in the first century CE as evidenced in various sources. However, prior to the Hasmonean period, this holiday and its fasting components were not attested outside of the Pentateuch. Again, some biblical texts from later periods also lack any mention of the Day of Atonement, suggesting that it was not universally known among all Jewish writers during those times. Sukkot, booths, and the four species evidence from the first century. The festival of Sukkot, also known as the festival of booths or the festival of ingathering, is a significant autumnal event mentioned several times in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Two unique practices associated with Sukkot are explained in Leviticus 23, 40, 42 through 43. The first practice involves taking the fruit of a majestic tree, branches of palm trees, a leafy tree's bow, and willows of the brook. The second practice is dwelling in the booths, temporary structures, for seven days. These practices are intended to commemorate the Israelites' time in booths, when they were brought out of Egypt. In the first instruction, it's not entirely clear what should be done with the mentioned floral elements after they are taken. The second instruction involves residing in booths, suggesting the construction of some temporary shelters. Historical records suggest that these practices were observed by Judeans in the first century CE. Philo, writing around 38 CE, mentioned that Judeans in Alexandria celebrated the festival by living in booths. Josephus, a Jewish historian from the same period, described the custom of building booths during Sukkot as widespread among Judeans. He also mentioned the practice of taking the four species, including the citron, palm branches, myrtle, and willow during the festival. The use of these four species was described in detail by Josephus, clarifying certain aspects of the Pentateuchal instructions. He explained that the citron represented the fruit of the majestic tree, myrtle was the leafy tree, and the three leafy species were to be bound together as a wand, bouquet, and held with the citron. The importance of the four species in Sukkot is further emphasized by their presence on bronze coins minted during the Great Revolt in 69 to 70 CE. These coins featured variations of the four species motif, highlighting the symbolic value of these practices. Plutarch, a writer from the late first century CE, also mentioned the Judean customs during Sukkot, including living in booths and carrying branches, although he mixed details from different autumnal festivals. Earlier evidence. Evidence for the central Sukkot rituals, residing in booths and carrying the four species, can be traced back to as early as the last two centuries BCE, although the evidence is limited and somewhat problematic. For instance, a rebellion against Alexander Janaeus in the early first century BCE involved pelting the king with citrons during the festival of booths, indicating that this practice was in place at that time. Texts from the Hasmonean period, such as the Book of Jubilees and the Temple Scroll, provide more reliable evidence of how these rituals were understood and practiced. Jubilees describes Abraham celebrating Sukkot by building boots, offering sacrifices, and carrying branches. The temple scroll prescribes the construction of booths on the roofs of certain buildings in the temple's outer court during Sukkot. The author of 2 Maccabees also mentioned a celebration resembling Sukkot, where Judas Maccabeus and his men carried wands, beautiful branches, and palm fronds in a procession. However, this event occurred at a different time, and the items carried did not precisely match those listed in Leviticus 23:40, Before the 2nd century BCE, the only evidence of the central Sukkot rituals is found in Nehemiah 8, 13 through 18. This passage mentions collecting various foliage to build booths and recalls a commandment from Moses regarding Sukkot observance. However, it's unclear whether these rituals were widely practiced at the time. Evidence for the observance of Sukkot rituals, including dwelling in booths and carrying the four species, becomes more substantial from the Hasmonean period onward, with limited evidence suggesting their practice in earlier times. The Nehemiah passage provides early evidence, but doesn't necessarily confirm widespread observance. The seven-branched menorah, evidence from the first century CE. The Pentateuch, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, includes instructions for the construction of a golden lampstand called menorah with seven branches. This menorah is decorated with stylized cups, calyxes, and flower petals, and it is to be placed in the tabernacle 
with its lamps continuously lit. During the first century CE, there's a strong evidence that a menorah closely following these Pentateuchal instructions was indeed present in the Jerusalem temple. Josephus, who was a Jerusalem priest and eyewitness, provided a detailed description of the menorah. He also reported that when the temple was destroyed in 70, the Romans took the menorah among the spoils and displayed it in Rome's Temple of Peace. The famous bas relief on the Ark of Titus corroborates Josephus's account depicting the menorah carried by the Romans. Recent studies using spectroscopy have confirmed that the menorah was originally depicted as golden on this relief. The commandment regarding the menorah was not limited to the physical artifact in the temple. It also influenced the consciousness of lay Judeans living outside the temple's direct influence. Josephus described the setting up and continual lighting of the menorah as obedience to the law, suggesting that regular Judeans would have learned about these laws when relevant Pentateuchal passages were publicly read and taught in synagogues. Archaeological artifacts from the first century CE, including sundials, ossuaries, vessels, reliefs, oil lamps, and graffiti, graffiti feature depictions of the menorah. This suggests that awareness of the menorah ritual mandated by Torah law was widespread among first century Judeans. Earlier evidence. The awareness of the temple menorah in the mid first century BCE is supported by numismatic evidence. Mattathias Antigonus, a historical figure from this period, featured a depiction of the seven branch menorah on one of his bronze coins you can see right now. There are also historical accounts that mention the temple menorah such as Pompey's encounter with the sacred lampstand upon entering the sanctuary and Antiochus IV's removal of the lampstand of light, which was later replaced by Judas Maccabeus' men. These accounts, however, do not provide a detailed description of the menorah's appearance. The Hebrew Bible outside of the Pentateuch mentions lampstands in Solomon's temple, but these references lack descriptions and do not necessarily align with the Pentateuchal menorah. Only the book of Zechariah describes a seven-lamp golden lampstand with a bowl, seven lips, and two olive trees, but this vision is not directly connected to the Jerusalem Temple Menorah. During the first century CE, there is strong evidence that the Temple Menorah closely followed Pentateuchal instructions. However, before the mid-first century BCE, there is limited evidence for the appearance and awareness of the seven-branched menorah, with some references lacking detailed descriptions or clear connections to the Pentateuchal Menorah. Concluding these various practices in this entire section, we explored various customs and practices that were significant aspects of the way of life for people in Judea during the first century CE. We looked at how circumcision was a widespread practice among Judeans during this time, serving not only as a marker of their identity, but also as a central commandment of the Torah, their religious text. Sabbath laws were also commonly observed by Judeans, both in Judea and across the Mediterranean world. These laws, which governed activities on the Sabbath day, were subject to discussion and debate among Torah scholars. Additionally, historical evidence indicates that the Passover sacrifice, the Festival of Unleavened Bread, and the Day of Atonement were all observed by Judeans on a large scale during this period. The main ritual for the Day of Atonement involved fasting, practice, universally recognized among first century Judeans. Moreover, the ritual associated with the festival of Sukkot, such as residing in temporary booths and using specific plant species, were widely practiced. Finally, a seven-branched menorah, as prescribed by Torah law, was unquestionably present in the temple during the first century CE, and both texts and archaeological discoveries confirm that Judeans of that era were aware of its existence and appearance. All of these aspects of first century Judaism have some evidence dating back to the first century BCE, and in some cases, the second century BCE. However, there's no clear evidence of these practices before this period. Circumcision, for example, was considered a requirement by Torah law as early as the second century BCE, but there's no evidence outside the Torah suggesting that it was practiced as a divine commandment or legally mandated before that time. Similarly, Sabbath observance can be traced back to the second century BCE, but there is no reliable evidence indicating that the concept of certain activities being forbidden on the Sabbath day was widely known or observed among the Judean population before then. The extent to which Passover, the festival of unleavened bread, and the Day of Atonement were observed in the last two centuries BCE is not well documented. Before this period, there is little evidence to gauge the extent of these rituals, observances, or even awareness. The same applies to the Day of Atonement, which is unattested before the Hasmonean period, and there is no evidence of it outside of the Pentateuch 
to in earlier biblical sources. Regarding the practices associated with Sukkot, residing in booths and taking the four species, there's some evidence dating back to the last two centuries BCE, but it is difficult to determine how widely they were observed by the general population. Before the second century BCE, the only evidence of these rituals is found in a single passage in Nehemiah, which may be more of an idealized depiction than an accurate reflection of the practices of the time. Lastly, the seven-branched menorah is documented as early as the first century BCE, but it's absent from ancient Judean art and earlier texts outside of the Torah before that period. All the practices we have examined in this section characterize Judaism in the first century CE and have some historical evidence dating back to the first century BCE, and in some cases, second century BCE. However, there's no compelling evidence to suggest that these practices were commonly observed or widely known before the second century BCE. This challenges the idea that these practices became widespread during the Babylonian exile and the early days of the return to Zion. The Bible indicates that, or at least says that this is what they did. No archaeological evidence backs that up. While these practices are present in certain sections of the Torah, it is important not to confuse the date of a document's composition with a time when it gained widespread acceptance and authority among ordinary Judeans. The evidence we've examined does not support the notion that these practices were commonly observed as early as the Babylonian or Persian periods. The Synagogue we're shifting our focus to something different from our previous topics, the synagogue. Unlike the practices and rules governed by Torah law that we've explored before, the synagogue isn't explicitly mentioned in the Torah. However, by the first century CE, it had become a central institution for Judeans, second only to the Jerusalem temple. Its significance lies in its role as the primary means of spreading the Torah, which is crucial for understanding the development and spread of Judaism. So to investigate the origins of Judaism, we need to look at when evidence for the synagogue first appeared. The question of how and why the synagogue came into existence has been widely discussed, but I'll focus on a more specific aspect in this section. Like in the previous chapters, I'll start by describing what the synagogue looked like in the first century CE based on the evidence from that time. Turns out, the synagogue primarily served as an educational center. Local Judean communities would gather there weekly to hear the public reading of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, possibly along with other sacred texts. This reading was followed by an oral explanation or learned this reading was followed by an oral explanation or learned discussion. I'll also show that synagogues were prevalent, not only in Judea, but also among Judean communities in other regions. Thus, the synagogue played a crucial role in spreading the Torah among Judeans. Once we understand how synagogues functioned in the first century, we'll delve into the earliest available evidence for something similar to synagogues in the centuries leading up to the first century. Textual first century evidence. Here's some of the first century textual evidence for the existence and function of synagogues which were crucial institutions in Judean communities at the time. Philo's perspective. Philo, a prominent thinker of the era, frequently referenced to places where Judeans gathered for communal activities. He used the terms place of prayer or place of assembly to describe these places, essentially what we now call synagogues. According to Philo, these gatherings were organized to ensure that Judeans had a deep understanding of their ancestral laws and customs, mainly through the weekly reading of the sacred laws. This practice involved both reading from the Pentateuch and providing oral explanations to help people grasp the finer points of the laws. Philo's description highlights that synagogues served as educational centers, aiming to disseminate knowledge of the Torah widely among the Judean population. In the New Testament, particularly the Gospels and Acts, they also frequently mention synagogues. They depict Judeans gathering in synagogues primarily on the Sabbath, emphasizing the educational aspect of these institutions. For instance, Jesus and Paul are often portrayed as visiting synagogues to teach. In these narratives, the synagogue setting involves reading from sacred texts, followed by oral explanations or discussions. The Gospel of James James even suggests that this Torah education happened every Sabbath in synagogues across various cities. Josephus, of course another historical source, reinforces the idea of synagogues as centers for Torah education. He mentions how Moses instituted the regular assembly of Judeans to hear and deeply understand the law, applying both reading and detailed learning. Josephus asserted this system was so effective that every Judean knew the laws by heart. In addition to education, in addition to education, Philo also mentioned that
that synagogues were used for collecting annual first fruits to be sent to Jerusalem temple for sacrifices. Furthermore, various sources suggest that synagogues sometimes served as venues for corporal punishment, almsgiving, and prayer, although these activities didn't define the institution's primary purpose. Evidence from Philo, the New Testament, and Josephus paints a coherent picture of first century synagogues. These institutions were widespread in Judean communities, both in their homeland and the diaspora. Their main function was education, with regular gatherings for the reading and oral explanation of the Torah and other sacred texts. Additionally, synagogues occasionally hosted other communal activities. This educational and communal role was central to the identity and purpose of synagogues in the first century CE. Epigraphic and archaeological clues. When we delve into the ancient past, we encounter various inscriptions that shed light on the religious gatherings of Judeans in the first century CE. These inscriptions are like historical snapshots, offering glimpses into a world long gone. One particularly significant find, known as the Theodotus inscription, carries vital information about the nature of these gatherings during that era. Discovered in a water cistern in the southeastern part of Jerusalem, the city of David, during excavations in the early 20th century, this Greek inscription, etched on a rectangular limestone slab, was uncovered amidst debris from the destruction of 70 CE. Experts believe it was crafted sometime in the late 1st century BCE or early 1st century CE. The inscription serves as a commemoration of the founding of a synagogue and starts by stating its purpose. Theodotus, son of Vitinos, priest and Archisynagogus, son of an Archisynagogus, grandson of an Archisynagogus, built the synagogue for the reading of the law and teaching of the commandments. This inscription aligns with what ancient authors of the 1st century repeatedly emphasized. It directly confirms that primary activities conducted within the synagogue, the reading of the law, and the teaching of the commandments. What stands out most is the inscription's assertion that the dissemination of the Torah to the public was the fundamental reason behind the constructing of synagogues. Additional inscriptions from the 1st century CE offer valuable evidence regarding the widespread presence of synagogues. One such inscription dating to 55 CE and discovered in Berenice records the names of numerous donors who contributed to the restoration of their community synagogue. Another inscription from an unidentified location in Egypt and dating to the 1st or 2nd century CE commemorates an individual who built a place of prayer for themselves, their spouse, and children. In Acmonia, the local Judean community honored a non-Judean aristocrat named Julia Severa for her role in constructing a building. This inscription also mentions an archon and two synagogue heads who contributed to the restoration and beautification of the structure. From the Bosporus region, which was a vassal kingdom under Roman control at the time, we have discovered eight inscriptions referencing Judean communities and their communal buildings, all dating to the 1st and 2nd century CE. These inscriptions typically concern the manumission, freeing of slaves, with the procedure taking place in the place of prayer. The Judean community would assume legal responsibility for the freed individuals who in turn were expected to continue attending the place of prayer regularly. These findings collectively provide valuable insight into the historical context of Judean religious life during this period. In the realm of archaeology, our journey into understanding first century CE synagogues begins with the discovery at Masada during Yagin Gal Yadin's excavations from 1963 to 1965. What emerged was a structure measuring roughly 15 by 12 meters, featuring a primary hall with a smaller room protruding from its northern corner. Four tiers of benches lined the interior walls of the main hall, and a single bench abuted the wall of the northern room. This building had once been supported by five columns. Its substantial size suggested it was a public edifice, while the benches clearly indicated its function as an assembly hall capable of accommodating a sizable gathering. However, what definitively confirmed it as a synagogue were the remnants of scrolls from the books of Deuteronomy and Ezekiel discovered in two pits dug into the floor of the northern room. Since the Masada find, several similar structures from the first century CE had been identified as synagogues through excavations at various locations, including Gamla, Magdala with two buildings, Tel Rakesh, Kerbet Diab, Kiryat Sefer, Um, El 
Umdan, Herodium, and Kerbet Atwani. Forgive me if I butchered some of these names, but you saw them on the screen. In all these cases, the excavated structures were considered public buildings due to their size and the presence of benches along their interior walls. There are strong grounds to associate these buildings at Masada and elsewhere with the institution described in the literary sources we've examined. Setting aside these texts for a moment, let's consider how we might interpret such structures purely from an archaeological standpoint. Imagine excavating a similar building in China, Ireland, or Peru, a spacious area encircled by benches. Our functional analysis would likely conclude that this space was intended for gatherings. The seating arrangement would suggest that the center of the room was the focal point where everyone seated faced, and participants could easily see, hear, and communicate with each other. An archaeologist encountering such a structure would likely label it an assembly hall or a meeting house. It wouldn't matter where in the world or what historical period it belonged to, the functional interpretation would remain similar. When these types of buildings are unearthed in Judean sites dating to the first century CE, we could take an additional step. The contemporary literary sources we've examined refer to a Judean institution centered around an assembly hall, the synagogue. In Greek, one of the primary names for this institution, synagogue, literally means place of assembly. In Hebrew and Aramaic, it translates to house of assembly. These texts mention the institution in Judean communities of various sizes across the southern Levant, a match with archaeological assembly halls. Additionally, none of these literary sources report any other common Judean institution that fits the description of these archaeological assembly halls. Using Occam's razor, the simplest explanation is that the assembly halls discovered through archaeology are indeed the synagogues described in the literary sources. This argument gains further support from the fortunate discovery of fragments of Deuteronomy and Ezekiel scrolls in the Masada building. While Yadin's idea that the room served as a Geniza annex is somewhat anachronistic, it seems more than coincidental that these artifacts central to synagogue activities were found within the walls of a first century Judean assembly hall. If we accept these fragments strongly endorse the identification of the Masada structure as a synagogue, then buildings at other sites resembling the Masada one should, by analogy, also be rightfully considered synagogues. A wealth of evidence, literary, epigraphic, and archaeological, paints a picture of the first century synagogue as an institution primarily dedicated to disseminating the Torah and related sacred texts through public readings and oral lectures during gatherings of local Judean communities. While variations may have existed from one community to another, this broad strokes depiction likely represents a common institution among Judean communities worldwide. Besides the Jerusalem Temple, no other institution seems to have played a more central role in the communal life of Judeans during this time. Early Evidence for Synagogue-like Institutions As we seek to uncover the earliest evidence resembling the institution of the synagogue as defined in the first century CE, we turn to both literary and physical sources, epigraphic, papyrological, and archaeological. Textual Evidence from Philo and Josephus Philo, the historian, stated that during the reign of Augustus, multiple places of prayer existed in Rome where the city's Judeans would assemble, particularly on sacred Sabbaths for communal study of their ancestral philosophy. Philo claimed that Augustus sanctioned these gatherings and even sent letters to provincial governors in Asia, instructing them to allow Judeans to assemble in synagogues. However, these claims come from Philo's embassy to Gaius and are presented in an apologetic context, raising doubt about their accuracy. Josephus also cited a letter from Augustus to the provincial governors of Asia ordering severe consequences for those caught stealing sacred books or money from a Sabbath hall or a banquet hall. This Sabbath hall is likely a synagogue where sacred books and money were stored before being sent to Jerusalem. The term banquet hall is more ambiguous, and it has been suggested that it might refer to a Torah ark. Josephus' citation of this letter is also in an apologetic context, casting doubt on its authenticity. These accounts by Philo and Josephus describe an institution that resembles the first century CE synagogue, primarily dedicated to the communal gatherings for the public reading and teaching of Torah, but their apologetic context warrants caution. Additionally, Josephus referred to a speech by Nicholas. Additionally, Josephus referred to a speech by Nicholas of Damascus, who mentioned the Judeans dedicating every seventh day to the study of their customs and laws. If these accounts are not anachronistic, they provide some 
of the earliest literary evidence for the existence of synagogue-like institutions in the mid to late first century CE. Before Augustus, Josephus mentioned three instances of Judean communal institutions, which may or may not have functioned like synagogues. In one case, plunder taken from the Jerusalem temple by Antiochus IV in the early second century BCE was returned to the Judeans of Antioch to be stored in their synagogue. However, it's unclear how this synagogue functioned under later Seleucid rulers. In another instance, Josephus cited a decree from the people of Halicarnassus permitting the local Judean community to build places of prayer near the sea. Again, the nature of activities in these houses remains unclear. Lastly, Josephus mentioned a decree from the people of Sardis allowing Judeans to gather with their families for ancestral prayers and sacrifices, with a place designated for this purpose. However, this differs from the known practices of the first century CE synagogue. Dead Sea Scrolls The Dead Sea Scrolls, while rich in historical content, do not contain references to a house of assembly resembling a synagogue. The closest reference to regular public readings of Torah in the community rule 1QS, which prescribes nightly study sessions involving reading from the book, studying the law, and offering blessings. However, this occurs on a nightly basis and does not necessarily suggest the presence of synagogues outside the sectarian community. Apocrypha, Pseudepigrapha, and the Hebrew Aramaic Bible. There's no mention of a building or institution resembling a synagogue. The earliest evidence of, for synagogue-like institutions is found in the accounts of Philo and Josephus during the reign of Augustus. Although these accounts are presented in an apologetic context, there are also some vague references to Judean communal institutions before Augustus. The nature of these institutions is less clear. The Dead Sea Scrolls, Apocrypha, Pseudepigrapha, and the Hebrew Aramaic Bible do not provide direct evidence for synagogue or synagogue-like institutions. Earlier archaeological evidence. The evidence for the existence of synagogue-like institutions before the first century CE is indeed sparse and often subject to interpretation and debate. Here are some key points from the epigraphic and archaeological evidence discussed. Dedicatory inscriptions. Several dedicatory inscriptions in Egypt dating to the Ptolemaic era mention a place of prayer. These inscriptions date as early as 246 to 221 BCE. While these inscriptions are among the earliest pieces of evidence, they do not provide detailed information about the functioning of these early institutions referred to as places of prayer. Papyrological evidence. Some papyri from Egypt make references to Judean house of prayer. For example, one papyrus mentions a dispute related to a cloak and mentions a Judean place of prayer in Alexandra Nisos. Another papyrus from Crocodilopolis, forgive me for butchering that, mentions a Judean place of prayer, but it remains unclear how the building was used. A papyrus fragment hints at a meeting in a house of prayer associated with an association, but the document is too fragmentary to provide detailed insights. Archaeological evidence. The Um El Umdan Synagogue is one of the earliest synagogue buildings identified, with an earlier Hasmonean phase dated to the late 2nd or early 1st century BCE. The identification of a building on Delos, GD 80, as a synagogue from this early period is subject of debate among scholars. Here's some of the interpretations and challenges. The term prosike was used in Ptolemaic era inscriptions in Egypt, but it is unclear how closely these early institutions resembled the 1st century CE. E. Synagogue. It is possible that the term prosike originally referred to an institution focused primarily on prayer, and over time the function evolved into what we recognize as the synagogue in the first century. While there are some references to early synagogues, their exact nature and function in these earlier periods remain uncertain. While there are references to institutions resembling synagogues in earlier periods, the evidence is often ambiguous and does not provide a clear picture of how these institutions functioned before the first century CE. The development of the synagogue, as it is known in the first century CE, appears to have been a gradual process, and the terminology used in earlier periods may not necessarily reflect the same institution. The origins of Judaism reappraised. 
We have been examining the customs and rules laid out in the Torah, which by the first century CE had become an integral part of mainstream Judaism. Our goal has been to find evidence both in texts and physical artifacts, indicating whether these practices and rules were followed by ordinary Jewish people in the centuries leading up to the first century. In every instance, we discovered the evidence only goes back as far as the second century BCE at the earliest. In the last chapter, we found that the earliest evidence of regular Jewish gatherings gatherings in synagogues to read and interpret the Torah collectively dates to the 2nd or even the 1st century BCE. This evidence strongly suggests that the 2nd century BCE is the earliest point at which the Torah began to spread widely among the Jewish population and to be accepted as authoritative law. In simpler terms, the Judaism we discuss in this book likely emerged in the middle of the 2nd century BCE or earlier. Now in this chapter, we want to go beyond the data-driven boundary and explore when it most likely that the Torah was was adopted as authoritative law among the Jewish population. We will start by investigating the possibility that this happened as early as the Persian period, a notion that many scholars have assumed in the past, as we discussed in the introduction. However, we will demonstrate there are compelling reasons to believe that during the Persian period, many Jewish people may not have been aware or of anything resembling the Pentateuch or were not adhering to its laws. Afterward, we will discuss the likelihood that Judaism might have emerged during the subsequent early Hellenistic period. We will conclude this chapter by cautiously considering the idea that the Torah became widely known among the masses and was seen as authoritative law only in the late Hellenistic period, particularly following the significant events associated with the Hasmonean revolt in the middle of the 2nd century BCE. The Persian period, 539 to 332 BCE. Cyrus the Great, who ruled from around 559 to 530 BCE, was a member of the Tespid Achaemenid royal families in Persia. He achieved a significant conquest in 539 BCE when he took control of Babylon, gaining control over the vast territories that comprised the Neo-Babylonian Empire at that time. During the period of Persian rule, which lasted until the conquest of Alexander the Great in the 330s BCE, there were several communities of Judeans who identified themselves as such and lived in various parts of this Persian-controlled region. Our goal is to explore the possibility to see if it is likely that the Torah and the sacred text of Judaism have been accepted as the authoritative law by the Judean people and put into practice during the Persian period. To do this, we will begin by examining biblical accounts that are set in the time of the Tisbid Achaemenid kings. These accounts tell the story of a Judean official named Ezra who is said to have publicly disseminated the Torah of Moses among the people of Judea. Next, we'll delve into the theory of Persian imperial authorization, which suggests that the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, became recognized as as authoritative source of law for Judeans with the support and sponsorship of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. We will analyze the primary evidence derived from archaeological findings and inscriptions from three Judean communities within the Persian realm, Judea itself, referred to as Yehud, Elephantine, and Babylonia. Our aim is to assess to what extent the religious practices and rituals of these communities aligned with or diverged from the rules and regulations outlined in the Pentateuch. This analysis will help us determine whether the Torah was indeed widely practiced and regarded as authoritative law among these Judean communities during the Persian period. Ezra and Nehemiah's impact on the acceptance of the Torah of Moses in ancient Judea. The canonical text of Ezra and Nehemiah appears to be a composite work, comprising various sources written by different authors over time. Several of these sources describe the public dissemination of the Torah of Moses among the people of Judea during the Achaemenid period and its subsequent adoption as binding law. This provides an overview of these narratives and examines whether they reflect historical events in which the Torah gained widespread acceptance as authoritative law among the Judean population during the Persian period. Introduction to Ezra and Nehemiah's Torah Narratives Ezra 7 introduces Ezra, a priest described as a skilled scribe well-versed in the teachings of Moses. He arrives in Jerusalem during the seventh year of the Persian king Artaxerxes with a mission to inquire into the teachings of the Lord, teach statutes and ordinances to the people of Israel and enforce God's law. An Aramaic letter from King Artaxerxes authorizes Ezra to point magistrates and judges to uphold these laws with strict penalties for those who disobey. Upon his arrival, Ezra discovers that the people have intermarried with foreigners, which is considered a transgression of God's commandments. In response, Ezra calls for repentance, suggesting that the sinners should separate from their foreign wives. The account of how Ezra's educational mission unfolds is found in Nehemiah 8. A large gathering of people 
people assembles before the water gate of Jerusalem and requests that Ezra read the book of the instruction of Moses, which God had commanded Israel to follow. Ezra reads from the book from dawn to noon with assistance helping the people understanding the teachings. The people's response is emotional, with many weeping upon hearing the words of the Torah. Subsequently, the heads of families, priests, and Levites gather to learn from the Torah and discover various commandments, including the observance of the Festival of Booths, which they had not practiced for a long time. Ezra continues to read from the book daily until the end of the seventh day holiday. Following this, a group of Levites addresses a prayer to the Lord, recounting key events from the Pentateuch, emphasizing the divine or origin of the Torah, and making a covenant to follow God's instruction, commandments, ordinances, and statutes. Nehemiah 13 reports the public reading of Moses' book, leading the separation of Ammonites and Moabites from the congregation. It also highlights violations of the Sabbath and foreign marriages among the people, which Nehemiah addresses by enforcing Sabbath regulations and prohibiting these practices. Evaluating the historical accuracy of Ezra and Nehemiah's Torah narratives. The narratives in Ezra and Nehemiah primarily focus on the efforts of Judean leaders, particularly Ezra, to promulgate the Mosaic Torah as authoritative law among the common Judean populace. However, it is crucial to examine whether these stories have a basis in historical reality. Little is known about the authors of these texts, making it challenging to determine when they were written. Their primary interests appeared to be Judean, and their writings emphasize the importance of observing the Mosaic Torah. These texts are best categorized as ideological stories about the past, aiming to convey an ideological agenda rather than historical accuracy. Even if one were to consider these narratives as reflecting historical events, they do not suggest a lasting impact of Ezra's efforts on the Judean masses. The accounts in Nehemiah indicate that the people reverted to their previous transgressions after an initial acceptance of the Torah. In summary, the tales of Ezra and Nehemiah's efforts to promote the Mosaic Torah do not provide compelling evidence for the emergence of Judaism as early as the Persian period. These stories should be viewed as idealized depictions with an ideological agenda rather than an accurate account of historical events. The Theory of Persian Imperial Authorization Some scholars have proposed the theory of Persian Imperial Authorization, suggesting that the Achaemenid authorities may have played a role in codifying the Pentateuch as the official legal code for the province of Yehud. However, this hypothesis has faced significant challenges. First, it's unclear whether the evidence cited to support this theory points to a unified Achaemenid policy of granting imperial authorization to local legal norms, the documents used as evidence often have ambiguous meanings, and the cases they describe present an incongruous picture of Persian authorities' dealings with local matters. Second, even if one were to accept the idea of Achaemenid authorization, it is unlikely that the Persian authorities would have ratified a document like the Pentateuch, which includes extensive narrative material and regulations that may have conflicted with imperial interest. The content and format of the Pentateuch does not align with what one would expect from the officially authorized legal code. The theory of Persian imperial authorization has few adherents today due to the lack of substantial evidence and the challenges it faces in explaining the origins of the Pentateuch. It is essential to critically evaluate historical hypotheses based on available evidence and context. Archaeological and epigraphic evidence. Archaeological and epigraphic evidence from the Persian period sheds light on the ritual and cultic practices of Judeans in different geographical locations including Judea, Elephantine in Egypt, and Babylonia. This evidence helps us understand the extent to which the Judeans may have followed Torah laws. In Judea, there is limited evidence that suggests some people were not strictly adhering to Pentateuchal dietary laws as they were consuming catfish, a fish prohibited in the Torah. Coins minted in the 4th century BCE Yehud also displayed human and animal images, which may have been inconsistent with Pentateuchal regulations. Additionally, terracotta figurines and an anthropomorphic morphic vessel with a human face had been found at various sites in Yehud, potentially indicating deviations from religious practices outlined in the Pentateuch. Regarding the cultic sphere, there is evidence of the veneration of the deity Yahweh among Judeans in Persian-era Yehud. The use of theophoric elements derived from Yahweh in personal names suggest a continued devotion to this deity. References to a high priest in Jerusalem in an elephantine papyri implies the existence of a temple dedicated to the cult of Yahweh. However, 
No archaeological remains of a Persian period temple in Jerusalem have been identified. In terms of ritual artifacts, there is a lack of cultic figurines and sanctuaries in Persian period Yehud compared to neighboring regions. Some scholars have proposed that this absence reflects a religious revolution in which pagan elements were purged from Judean religious practices. However, recent research has challenged this hypothesis, highlighting the need for more nuanced interpretation of the archaeological evidence. Coins from Persian era Judea also raise questions about the exclusivity of Yahweh worship. Some coins imitated Athenian prototypes featuring the image of the Greek goddess Athena. Other coins displayed potentially different deities alongside Yahweh, suggesting a possible coexistence of various divine beings in the religious consciousness of Judeans during this period. The archaeological and epigraphic evidence provides insights into the religious practices of Persian period Judeans, but it does not conclusively demonstrate widespread adherence to Pentateuchal regulations. The evidence suggests a complex religious landscape in which the veneration of Yahweh coexisted with other practices and beliefs, leaving room for a diversity of religious expressions among the Judean communities of the time. Elephantine. In the upper Nile region of Egypt, specifically on the island of Elephantine and its neighboring mainland settlement of Syene, archaeologists have uncovered a significant collection of papyri and ostraca dating back to the Persian era. This remarkable discovery sheds light on a Judean community that thrived during the 5th century BCE. These ancient texts provide a glimpse into the religious and cultural practices of this community, which identified itself as Judeans and worshipped a deity referred to as Yah or Yah shortened forms of Yahweh. These documents contain precise dates ranging from the early 5th century BCE to the end of that century. Notably, the Judean leadership at Elephantine engaged in written correspondence with fellow Judeans in Judea proper, including the provincial governor of Yehud and a high priest and subordinate priesthood in Jerusalem. Some previous scholarship has attempted to interpret these Elephantine texts in light of the Pentateuchal laws, drawing parallels between the practices described in the documents and biblical rules of purity, the observance of Passover, and the festival of unleavened bread. However, it's essential to approach these interpretations with caution, as they assume from the outset that the Judeans of Elephantine were aware of and observed the laws of the Torah, leading to circular reasoning. Remarkably, none of the Elephantine documents explicitly mention the term Torah or an Aramaic equivalent, the name of Moses, or any document resembling the Pentateuch. Furthermore, there's no citation of verse that resemble those found in the Pentateuch. This suggests that the Torah, as known in later Jewish tradition, was not part of the religious landscape of Elephantine. Intriguingly, some documents within the Elephantine corpus seem to conflict with the assumption that the Judeans at this location regarded the Pentateuch as anything authoritative as a source of law or even knew of its existence. These Judeans simultaneously venerated multiple deities alongside Yahweh, directly contradicting the Pentateuch's prohibition of polytheism. For example, example, one document mentions a Judean woman named Miptaya who swore an oath by Sati, a goddess. Another document speaks of a Judean making an oath to Haram Bethel, referred to as the God. Yet another document mentions an oath invoking Harem, the God, in by the place of prostration. And I'm not even going to try and pronounce some of these words here, but you see them. Which could be interpreted as a reference to the goddess Anat as the consort of Yah. Some letters and inscriptions suggest a broader religious context where Judeans invoked multiple deities alongside Yahweh. For instance, a letter to fellow Judeans begins with a salutation invoking the gods, indicating a polytheistic framework. Another letter wishes welfare through the favor of all the gods. Additionally, a servant named Gibel blesses his Judean lord by Yah and by Kanum, invoking both the Judean deity and the Egyptian god Kanum. A particularly intriguing find is a papyrus scroll from Elephantine dated to around 419 or 400 BCE, listing individual members of the garrison of the Judeans who donated silver to Yah or Yahweh, along with sums allocated to other deities. While the distribution of offerings to multiple gods remains a mystery, it is evident that the Judean Jedaniah allocated contributions to Yahweh and two other Semitic deities without apparent controversy. The evidence of 
of polytheistic practices among the Judeans at Elephantine extends to cases where individuals with non-Hebrew names bearing theophoric elements of deities other than Yahweh are linked to those with Hebrew Yahwistic names. This implies that some Judeans chose names for their children that acknowledged deities beyond Yahweh. Furthermore, there is evidence of a temple dedicated to Yahweh on Elephantine Island throughout much of the 5th century BCE, which contradicts Deuteronomic prescriptions against offering sacrifices outside the chosen place in Cisjordan, Jerusalem. This temple, referred to as the Altar House, was operated by priests and staff conducting various ritual offerings and sacrifices. Several documents, including letters dated to 407 BCE, mention the destruction of this temple by troops from Syene and priests of Kanum in 410 BCE. The Elephantine Judeans sought assistance for its rebuilding, even contacting Judean officials in Yehud and Samaria. These documents do not indicate any awareness among the Elephantine Judeans that having a temple outside Jerusalem might be problematic. The evidence from Elephantine suggests that the Torah, as understood in later Jewish tradition, was likely unknown to Judeans living there. Their religious practices and cultic rituals appear to have diverged significantly from the prescriptions of the Pentateuch. Importantly, these practices do not seem to have differed substantially from those of other Judeans within the Persian Empire. This complex picture challenges previous assumptions about the homogeneity of the Judean religious observance during this period and invites further scholarly exploration. Babylonia a significant collection of cuneiform tablets dating from 572 to 477 BCE offers insights into the presence of Judeans in Babylonia during this period. These tablets provide a valuable historical record, shedding light on the lives and cultural practices of the Judean community in ancient Babylonia. Approximately one third of these tablets originated from a location known as Yahuda or Yahudu, Judah town or Alusa Yahudea, town of the Judeans. I butcher these, <laughs> so please forgive me. Others were written at sites named Alusa Nasar or Bit Nasar and Bit Ibriram. The individuals mentioned in these documents often bear names that are distinctly Hebrew or include Yahwistic theophoric elements. A similar pattern can be observed in the Marasu archive, another collection of texts from a slight later period within the Persian era, 455 to 403 BCE. Surprisingly, these documents do not indicate any knowledge of the existence of the Pentateuch among Babylonian Judeans during the 6th and 5th centuries BCE. BCE. There's no evidence to suggest that they observed the rules and regulations outlined in the Pentateuch. In fact, these texts reveal that Babylonian Judeans did not consciously avoid participating in transactions on Saturdays, which is noteworthy given the significance of the Sabbath in Judaic tradition. One particularly intriguing aspect is the presence of theophoric names associated with deities other than Yahweh among Judean families in both the Yahudu documents and the Marasu archive, albeit in small numbers. Of note is the deity Bit El, seemingly identical to the theonym Bethel, which played a prominent role in Judean documents from Elephantine. This suggests that Judeans in Babylonia may have incorporated the veneration of various gods alongside their reverence for Yahweh. The use of seals for signing documents also provides insights into the religious landscape of Babylonian Judeans. Some of these seals featured divine symbols or images of deities such as Marduk, Ish, Ishtar, Sin, and Ahura Mazda, suggesting a willingness to openly display reverence for other deities alongside Yahweh. Additionally, certain marriage agreements pertaining to Judeans invoked Babylonian deities like Marduk, Zarpa Nitu, and Nabu to enforce the terms of the agreement. The cuneiform tablets associated with Babylonian Judeans provide a nuanced perspective on their religious practices. Unlike the strict monotheism often associated with later Judaic tradition, these records suggest that the Judeans of Babylonia did not consider the veneration of Yahweh incompatible with the open display of reverence for other deities. This complex religious landscape challenges the conventional assumption and highlights the diversity of religious beliefs and practices among ancient ancient Judean communities. The available literary, epigraphic, and archaeological evidence from the Persian period does not strongly support the notion that a significant number of ordinary Judeans adhered to the precepts and prohibitions outlined in the Pentateuch during this early time frame. Moreover, there's little indication that the existence of a compilation resembling the Pentateuch or any other 
or any of its constituent parts was widely known beyond a small circle of Judean literati. The narratives in Ezra and Nehemiah, which describe mass acceptance of the Torah among the Judean populace, are best understood as ideological stories rather than accurate historical accounts. These narratives do not inherently suggest a reflection of historical reality. Even if we were to accept these tales at face value, they imply that Ezra's promulgation of the Torah had limited lasting impact on the Judean masses. The theory of Persian imperial authorization would suggest that the Achaemenid rulers would have sponsored the Pentateuch as the local law of Yehud lacks compelling evidence. Additionally, archaeological and epigraphic findings from Judea, Elephantine, and Babylonia indicate that Judean ritual and cultic practices during the Persian era often diverged significantly from the fundamental rules and regulations found in the Pentateuch. Notably, the acceptance or tolerance of the veneration of deities other than Yahweh was a common practice amongst these Judean communities, contrary to the Pentateuch's prescriptions against polytheistic worship. When we consider the popular ritual and cultic practices of the Judean masses during the Persian period, they seem to closely resemble those of their Iron Age ancestors. While some unique cultural practices may have been shared among Judeans under Persian rule, these practices did not necessarily give rise to what we now recognize as Judaism, a distinct way of life guided by a legal system rooted in the Pentateuch, complete with commandments, prohibitions, and regulations. Certainly, the evidence presented here does not definitively prove that the Torah did not emerge as the authoritative law of the Judeans during the Persian period. However, the evidence does suggest that familiarity with Torah observance was not widespread during this time, while instances of non-compliance with Torah laws are well documented. This leads us to consider that the origins of Judaism may be better sought in a later era, as the evidence does not strongly support its emergence during the Persian period. The Early Hellenistic Period, 332 to 167 BCE. During the early Hellenistic period, which spanned from 332 to 167 BCE, significant changes occurred in the region of the Persian Levant, including Judea. This era was marked by the conquest of Alexander the Great in 332 BCE, followed by the division of his empire among the generals known as the Diadochi after Alexander's death in 323 BCE. Judea changed hands multiple times during this period, eventually falling under the rule of Ptolemy I the Soter around 301 BCE, who got governed from Alexandria. It remained under Ptolemaic rule until approximately 200 BCE when Antiochus III Magus of the Seleucid Empire or dynasty, ruling from Antioch on the Orontes, seized control of the southern Levant. This dominion continued unchallenged until a revolt led by the Hasmonean family erupted, likely around 167 BCE during the reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. In this section, we aim to assess whether the Torah might have been embraced as the authoritative law by the common Judeans during the 165 year span between Alexander's conquest and the Hasmonean revolt. To do so, we will have to critically examine several literary sources that suggest the Torah's familiarity among regular Judeans during this period. Additionally, we will explore a hypothesis proposed by Michael Lefebvre, which suggests that the Pentateuch evolved from a descriptive collection of laws to a prescriptive code of law in response to contemporary Greek ideas about written law. Literary Evidence Citations of attributed to Hecateus of Abdera. Two sources purportedly cite the lost writings of Hecateus of Abdera, a late 4th century BCE figure. The first citations come from Josephus' Against Appian, but it is widely considered pseudepigraphic and not attributed to Hecateus. The second citation is found in the 9th century CE Bibliotheca of Photius, who quoted from the mid-1st century BCE author Diodorus Siculus. In Diodorus's account, he describes the Judeans as following followers of Moses, who established laws and customs for them. Diodorus claims to directly cite from the Judeans' law. Photius, however, accuses Diodorus of distorting the truth by falsely attributing his description to Hecateus, suggesting that this citation might be questionable. Modern scholars generally reject Photius's skepticism regarding Diodorus's claim to have drawn from Hecateus. Most believe that Diodorus did use Hecateus's work and that the citation may be from Hecateus of Abdera, circa 300 
500 BCE, not Hecateus of Miletus, circa 500 BCE. However, there are uncertainties regarding whether this citation truly represents direct Hecatean content, as Diodorus regularly combined information from multiple sources in his histories. Given these uncertainties, it's not compelling evidence to conclude that the Judean masses knew and regarded the Torah as authoritative by the 3rd century BCE, the letter of Aristius and the Septuagint. The letter of Aristius presents an account of a delegation sent to Jerusalem by Ptolemy II Philadelphus in the 270s BCE to translate the Judean law into Greek. This translation is described as divine legislation for all Judeans. While this account suggests the existence of a Judean law in the 270s BCE, its authenticity is debated among scholars, with many dating it to a later period. Even if we accept the early date of the translation, it doesn't necessarily indicate that the Pentateuch had already achieved widespread recognition and authority among the Judean masses. We lack historical context about the translation's reception among Greek-speaking Judeans. Additionally, the translators of the Septuagint consistently use the Greek term nomos to translate the Hebrew Torah. However, this choice doesn't conclusively establish that the Pentateuch was universally regarded as authoritative. Pentateuchal narratives and fragments of Demetrius the chronographer. Fragments attributed to Dr Demetrius the chronographer date to the reign of Ptolemy IV, Philip Hader, circa 221 to 204 BCE. While these fragments show familiarity with Pentateuchal narratives, they do not reference Mosaic or Judean laws. Thus, they provide no clear evidence of the Torah's recognition among the Judean masses. The ancestral laws and the letter and proclamation of Antiochus III. Josephus cites letters from Antiochus III Megas that mention ancestral laws granted to the Judeans after taking control of Judea around 200 BCE. Scholars debate the authenticity of these documents and whether they reflect the recognition of Mosaic law by the Judean masses. Given potential alterations over several centuries, caution is warranted in drawing conclusions about the normative authority of the Torah in 200 BCE. The Law and Commandments in Ben Sirah. The wisdom of Ben Sirah, composed in the 2nd century BCE, refers to Torah or Nomos and Commandments, but the precise meaning is debated. Ben Sirah's treatment of the Pentateuch appears more as an acknowledgment of its significance rather than a detailed engagement with its laws. The available literary evidence from the early Hellenistic period does not provide compelling support for the idea that the Torah was widely recognized as authoritative among the Judean masses during this time. The sources are subject to debate, lack clear historical context, and often represent the perspective of intellectuals rather than ordinary Judeans. Therefore, it remains challenging to determine the extent of the Torah's influence and recognition among the broader population in the Hellenistic era. Written law among the Greeks as a model for the Torah. The transformation of the Torah, the foundational text of Judaism, from a collection of descriptive laws to a prescriptive legal code is a complex historical process. This transformation took place during the early Hellenistic period, a time when Greek culture and influence spread throughout the ancient world. While there is limited direct evidence regarding the Torah's acceptance among the Judean masses during this period, the history of law development provides insights into how this transformation may have occurred. In this discussion, we explore the hypotheses put forward by Michael Lefebvre, suggesting that the exposure of Judeans to Greek concepts of written law played a pivotal role in the recharacterization or recharacterizing the Pentateuch as prescriptive Torah. Law collections prior to the emergence of written law. In our modern understanding, law collections are typically seen as prescriptive in nature, providing specific rules and regulations for society to follow. However, in ancient Mesopotamia, law writing served as different purposes. While there were extensive law collections, such as Hammurabi's Code, they were not considered legislative in the modern sense. Instead, these law codes primarily served as royal proclamations, testaments, and literary exercises, offering evidence of the king's divine mandate rather than prescribing legal norms. This prescriptive challenges the notions of legislation in the ancient Mesopotamian context, as laws were not codified in the way we understand them today. The early Greeks, like their Mesopotamian counterparts, had customs, traditions, and oral norms guiding behavior and resolving disputes, but they lacked a distinct body of rules known as the law. It was around the middle of the 7th century BCE that written laws began to appear in various Greek cities. These laws, inscribed on public monuments and prominently displayed, represented a revolutionary development. Unlike earlier societies, the Greeks made their laws publicly available, differentiating 
separating them from customary norms and traditions. Written Greek legislation covered a wide range of legal areas, including civil, criminal, and sacred matters such as rituals and festivals. These laws, referred to as sacred laws, were treated with the same level of formality and public accessibility as other legal norms. This shift from customary regulation to written legislation was a fundamental change in the Greek legal landscape and marked the emergence of true legislative systems. The emergence of Torah as the Judean law. Before the Hellenistic era, the Mosaic Torah was viewed as a descriptive collection of laws and a representation of Yahwistic ideals practiced by Moses rather than a prescriptive legal code. Michael Lefebvre proposed that the Torah's recharacterization into prescriptive law occurred during the Hellenistic period driven by two mechanisms. The first mechanism was the administrative changes introduced by Ptolemy II in Egypt around 275 BCE. These reforms organized the judiciary into the hierarchies of laws, which included recognition of Judean law for Judean litigants. This may have prompted the recharacterization of the Pentateuch as prescriptive law, making it the Judean law. Even without direct administrative influence, the broader cultural impetus of Greek notions about prescriptive law could have driven this transformation. The second mechanism was the cultural pressure of Hellenistic presuppositions, where prescriptive law was considered a hallmark of civilization. Greeks saw themselves as civilized, in contrast to barbarian peoples ruled by lawless despots. As Jude Judeans came under Greek cultural influence, they may have sought to align their own culture with the Greek model by recharacterizing the Pentateuch as prescriptive law. While direct evidence of the Torah's acceptance among the Judean masses during the early Hellenistic period is scarce, the influence of Greek concepts of written law offers a plausible explanation for its transformation into prescriptive law. Whether through administrative reforms or cultural pressures, the Hellenistic era provided a suitable backdrop for the emergence of the Torah as an authoritatively binding prescriptive law akin to the Greek model of written legislation. This transformation marked a crucial development in the history of legal systems and their impact on society. The Late Hellenistic Hasmonean Period 167 to 63 BCE during the mid-2nd century BCE, a series of complex events unfolded, leading the Judeans to gain independence from the Seleucid Empire and establish their autonomous polity under the rule of a Hasmonean family. The books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees attribute these events to the policies of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, which disrupted the cult in the Jerusalem temple and forbade the Judeans from following their native laws. An uprising began around 167 BCE, led by a priest named Mattathias from the Hasmonean clan and his sons, including Judas Maccabeus, Jonathan Uphus, and Simon Thassi, Simon, the last of the Thieves brothers, established an independent state in 142 BCE, marking the Hasmonean dynasty's rise to power, which continued until Pompey's conquest in 63 BCE. In the following discussion, we will explore the likelihood that the Torah was adopted by the Judean masses as their authoritative law during the Hasmonean period when they broke free from Seleucid rule. We will examine literary evidence from the books of Daniel 1 and 2 Maccabees to understand whether the Torah existed as an established law before Antiochian persecutions or if these accounts were later created as political propaganda to legitimize Hasmonean rule. Additionally, we will consider whether the proactive Hasmonean policies played a role in disseminating the Torah and making it the authoritative law among the Judean populace. The Literary Evidence the Antiochian persecutions in Daniel. In the second half of the book of Daniel, which is set in the Babylonian and Persian periods, but likely alludes to the reign of Antiochus IV, there are cryptic visions and prophecies that describe a king's actions against the Holy Covenant and the temple cult. While these texts are often interpreted as referring to Antiochus's decrees against the Torah, they primarily focus on the disruption of the temple cult rather than Torah observation itself. The references to a Holy Covenant and changing times and laws may allude to the Torah, but could also refer to the traditional temple rites, the law in the persecution narratives in 1st and 2nd Maccabees. In contrast to Daniel, 1 and 2 Maccabees emphasize the law and its observance in the context of Antiochian persecutions. These texts describe how Antiochus prohibited various Torah-related practices such as circumcision, Sabbath observance, and dietary laws. Many Judeans resisted these decrees and were willing to die for their faith. However, it is unclear 
unclear whether the Torah itself was widely regarded as authoritative among the Judean masses before these events. Hasmonean sponsorship for the Pentateuchal laws. There is a hypothesis suggesting that the Hasmonean leaders, particularly the sons of Metathias, played a pivotal role in promoting the Torah as the official laws of the Judeans. They may have adopted the Pentateuch to unify the newly formed Judean state and solidify their rule. This adoption of the Pentateuch as the legal foundation could have been portrayed as a restoration of an ancient original law downplaying its novelty. By doing so, they created a powerful ideological glue to counter the influence of the Greek culture and Hellenization, later Hasmonean territorial and cultural expansion. The Hasmonean leaders, such as John Hyrcanus and Aristobulus I, extended their dominion over neighboring regions and imposed Judean laws, including circumcision and Sabbath observance, on non-Judean populations. This suggests a deliberate effort to spread the Torah and integrate these regions into the Judean way of life, which might have been an extension of earlier Hasmonean policies aimed at promulgating the Torah among Judeans themselves. The Rise of Sectarianism the emergence of sectarian groups like the Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and the Qumran community, known for their legal disputes over Torah interpretation, coincided with the mid-2nd century BCE. This suggests that the widespread adoption of Pentateuch as authoritative law might have triggered disagreements over its proper interpretation, leading to the rise of these sects. This development aligns with the hypotheses. The Torah became widely accepted and authoritative during the Hasmonean period. While historical evidence is limited, there are indications that the Torah's adoption as authoritative law among the Judeans might have occurred during the Hasmonean period, especially under the leadership of the early Hasmoneans. The spread of the Torah, the portrayal of Antiochian persecutions, and the rise of sectarianism all point to significant developments in Judean religious and legal practices during this era. Conclusions the question of when Judaism first emerged, particularly whether it originated in the 2nd century BCE under the influence of the Hasmonean priestly family, has been a subject of investigation. The hypothesis suggests that the widespread adoption of the Torah among the Judean populace may have been facilitated by the proactive support of early Hasmonean leaders. These leaders may have legitimized their sponsorship of the Torah as the authoritative law of their newly autonomous polity by portraying themselves as the restorers of an ancient ancient divine legal system. While the idea that early Hasmonean leaders played a role in promoting the Torah remains speculative, it is known that their descendants actively promoted the Torah among the Semitic peoples they conquered. The emergence of sectarian groups with differing interpretations of the Torah during this period suggests that the widespread promotion of the Torah was relatively recent development. Throughout this documentary, we have consistently found that there is no evidence of a widely practiced Judean way of life governed by the Torah before for the 2nd century BCE. In the previous section, we had gone beyond the existing data to assess the likelihood of Judaism emerging during a specific historical period. Our analysis leads us to conclude that during the Persian period, the Judean way of life was likely guided by cultural traditions from the Iron Age rather than a formal Torah law. A central aspect of being a Judean at this time was the worship of Yahweh and participation in the deity's cultic rituals. Although the the extent to which this excluded the worship of other gods remains uncertain. Some practices found in the Pentateuch, such as the prohibition against eating the hip sinew and circumcision, may have been part of the Judean culture since the Persian period or even earlier. The evidence from Elephantine indicating a Judean form of Passover ritual and seven-day festival may also reflect ancient practices with unclear origins. However, there's little reason to believe these practices were legally mandated by something resembling Mosaic law. Therefore, the reconstructed Judean way of life in the Persian period without a Torah as a regulating principle does not resemble what we commonly understand as Judaism. The two centuries following Alexander the Great's conquest in 332 BCE until the establishment of the Hasmonean polity in the middle of the second century BCE appear to be a more favorable period to explore the origins of Judaism. Various hypotheses suggest that Judaism may have emerged during the early Hellenistic period when Judea was under Hellenistic rule or during the late Hellenistic 
Hellenistic period after Judeans gained autonomy under the Hasmonean family's leadership. In both scenarios, Judaism emerged in a world deeply influenced by Hellenistic culture, making it plausible to consider Judaism as a product of the Hellenistic crucible, the very term Judaism itself, a blend of Hebrew and Greek, underscores this cultural synthesis. This marks the conclusion of our exploration with the wonderful work of Dr. Jonathan Adler. His book is a must-grab because it goes much, much deeper into the sources that we could cover in this video. Looking back, we recognize that this is not the final chapter in the story of Judaism, but rather its prelude and introduction. Judaism has evolved in various directions throughout its history, giving rise to rabbinic Judaism and other influential branches. Moreover, the roots of Christianity and Islam can be traced back to the Judaism whose origins we have examined. In this perspective, the emergence of Judaism has played a pivotal role in shaping world history over the past two millennia, with its influence likely to continue for centuries or even millennia to come. Using Dr. Adler's archaeological evidence, I'd like to ask a question. If Judaism as a practiced way of life for the common Judeans didn't actually start till the second century BCE, then how far back can we safely say that the material we call the Bible and all of the extra canonical materials around this period goes. Is it really likely that the five books of Moses really go back to the early Persian period or even before that? Could it be that much of the materials scholars think is dated way, way back, like prophets or other books, are actually a late creation sometime after Hellenism set up shop in the world? Just as Dr. Adler starts with times we know the evidence exists, then work backwards into periods where it appears to be absent. Can we attempt to do this with the biblical texts? If we do this, how far back do these texts really go? Most scholars use internal textual evidence to attempt dating these materials. But what if that is circular and not driven by solid external data? I'm curious to hear your thoughts about this issue. Let us know in the comments section. Also, let us know if you enjoyed this documentary. I hope you purchased Dr. Adler's book on the origin of Judaism. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Join our Patreon and YouTube membership program. You can even get a one-time super thanks in support or one-time donation for the hard work we're doing here. We really could use all the support we can get to keep doing these. Sign up for one of the online academic courses we offer at www.mvp-courses.com. And never forget, we are MythVision.